Hello, hello everybody. Good morning. I say good morning because we are broadcasting from Italy and here is 9.15 in the morning now. I know there are people listening to us from uh, at least uh, 10 countries in the world. So let me say good morning in the Italian way. Buon mattino. My name is uh, Massimiliano Schiraldi and I am a professor of operation management at uh, Tor Vergata University of Rome, clearly in Italy. And I'm one of the general chairs of the conference. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the second edition of the conference on performance management, the 2023 edition. We are going to be together several hours today because we have many contributions and two very interesting keynote speeches at the beginning, obviously all on the topic of performance management. As to the topic, this has always been extremely relevant, we could say for centuries, because it's not simply related to the management of companies or the management of large organizations, but is a topic that in a general sense can be said to underlie any managerial activity. If then we focus on the last few decades, the importance of the topic has grown together with the development of process management theories, techniques and uh, technologies. And today we live in the era of uh, process automation. So now everyone is talking about performance management on a daily basis. And this is why we decided to dedicate the conference to this topic. However, I would like to take two more minutes in your time, not so much to talk about the topic, although it's extremely important, but to talk about the spirit of this conference. Indeed, I am convinced that this conference has a remarkable feature that needs to be highlighted. When we decided to design this conference, uh, the first edition, I say in 2021, then of course it was streamed in 2022, we had decided to design a conference that would be totally free for everyone. For everyone, meaning both for those who listen to the speeches and watch the presentations, but also for the authors presenting. For this reason, the conference was born and remains an online conference so that anyone can attend without the need of traveling. Moreover, it is publicly broadcasted. Indeed, as I'm speaking, we are live streaming both on LinkedIn and on the main YouTube channel of Tovergata University of Rome. In addition to that, however, we have decided that it should also be free for the authors. So when we launched the call for papers, we precisely specified that all the contribution that would be selected within the peer review process would be included in the conference, in today's presentations, and in the conference proceedings, which are published by Springer, by the way. And all of this would be free. I know it is not elegant to start talking about money at first, but it also it is also true that money is an important factor. And we all know very well how expensive it can be to attend an international conference, where in addition to the cost of traveling and lodging, there are also the registration fees, which can be very high. Especially we academics have to manage very wisely the very limited funds that we have at our disposal. So for us, the economic aspect is often very relevant. This is why we decided to design and organize a conference that would be free for everyone. This is something that I think is very important. And I think it was appropriate to emphasize it in the opening because it matches with the concept that knowledge should be free access to everyone. Now, with pleasure, I leave the floor to my dear friend and colleague, Filippo De Carlo, professor at the University of Florence, who will give you some more details about the organization of the conference. Thanks for your attention. And Filippo, to you the floor. Thank you, Max. Thank you very much. I'm very proud to be here with you for this second year. 
And uh, I'm very proud to be also in a team with a group of young and talented researchers who are behind the scenes and are working very hard to make it work as better as possible. Thank you again, Max. Thank you to all the speakers who will be with us. I just want to tell you something about uh, what we had last year and what we have this year. Uh, in the first edition of this conference, uh, last year we received papers for, from uh, five nations and we could select it, uh, 15 papers for publication. And we had more than 300 different unique viewers who joined the streaming last year, and we had also simultaneously more than 40 viewers. And each viewer stayed with us in the conference for on average 30 minutes. So also it was quite interesting, this value. This year we have 13 papers uh, coming from about 10 nations around the world. So uh, also this year we had uh, uh, contributions from all around the globe. And it's very important that this topic arises interest uh, all around the world in all the five continents. And so uh, thank you very much for being with us who are live and who will see this conference also later on. And I'd also like to remember you that uh, we have uh, the opportunity to have the proceedings of this conference published by Production Engineering, edited by Springer. And so uh, it's another opportunity to spread your contributions to all the researchers who are interested in the uh, performance of uh, the management in production and in services. So um, thank you very much for listening to me. I'm leaving the stage to Professor Alessandra Cantini, which is a researcher from the Polytechnic of Milan. Thank you, Filippo. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm pleased to officially start uh, the program of this second edition of the Copperman Conference. Uh, Copperman 2023 will be full of interesting lectures and presentations. And therefore, I'm now going to summarize the main program that we will follow today. So as you can see, um, we will, after this welcome ceremony with this short uh, initial ceremony, we will begin with two keynote speeches provided by two prestigious guest lecturers, Dennis Brendel and Andrea Fronzetti Coladon, who will be better presented in a few minutes. Then at around 10.30, we will have a short coffee break, after which we will move to the first part of the presentations. Here, international authors and researchers coming from 10 different nations will discuss their innovative works and contributions concerning the measurement and management of organizational performance in modern business environments. Next, there will be the lunch break, after which at around 3 p.m. we will start again with the second part of the presentations. Finally, uh, hoping to respect the timing, we will have a closer ceremony and we will conclude the Copperman Conference at around 4.30 p.m. So, since the agenda is very busy, um, according to our schedule, I'm now moved to present our first keynote speaker before leaving the floor to his interesting lecture. The first keynote speaker, good morning, Dennis. The first keynote speaker is uh, Mr. Daniel, Dennis Brendel, who is a MESA expert and also founder and chief consultant for the BR and all consulting, which is specialized in manufacturing IT, including ERP to shop floor system integration, mass specification and design, industrial networks and process automation, cybersecurity systems, and much, much more. Dennis has been an active member of the ISA 88 Batch Control System Committee for the past seven years, and he is editor of the ISA 95 Enterprise Control System Integration Standard. Dennis is a US expert in batch control, and he is also author of many publications on business to manufacturing integration and flexible manufacturing solutions. So 
Today, he will present us the lecture titled Performance Management in the Era of Total Automation. So good morning, Dennis. It's an honor to have you here at Copperman 2023. Um, Thank you. 30 minutes for your guest speech. Okay, great. Um, and if we can go to a presentation. Um, yes, what I wanted to talk about today, uh, because I like in keynote speeches to have people think about things that they may not have otherwise thought of. So I'm hoping that at the end of this talk, uh, you'll have something else uh, that you had not considered before. Uh, at least that is my hope. Uh, so good morning. I hope everyone has had their coffee and is ready to, uh, to start. Uh, I have, uh, uh, you've seen or heard uh, my background about what I uh, have been doing. Uh, and I have been working in the area of it, what we call ISA 95 or what is called the manufacturing execution systems or the manufacturing operations management systems uh, since actually 1995 when we started a lot of this work. And when the uh, opportunity came up to speak about performance management, well, performance management is about managing activities. And that's exactly what the whole concept is of the ISA 95 standard, which is also the IEC 62243 uh, standard. So I'll, I'd like to talk a little bit about those. Uh, but before uh, we start, I want to put a little scope behind what, we're, what I'd like to talk about, because I'd like to talk about where, not where we are today, but where we can be in five years or 10 years. Uh, and, and part of the reason for that is that we are in this massive set of changes that are occurring uh, because of information technology, because of the advancement of electronics and software and all those related industries, um, including things like additive manufacturing, um, uh, 3D modeling and all the other pieces that are out there. Uh, we've got industry 4.0, big data, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, smart manufacturing uh, initiatives that are going on, um, the um, the machine learning systems that basically have algorithms that we don't we don't even understand why they work. So with these changes going on, we need to look at where we want to be with performance management in five years to uh, ten years time frame. Um, and because if we talked about what we did today, I, by the time this presentation is, is done, uh, there'll be new information, there'll be new changes out there. So let's look a little bit further in the forward. Um, and uh, the concept here of looking at this is this is performance uh, management in the era of total uh, automation, uh, in the era of uh, when we have taken the concepts of procedure automation and applied them, not just to people, but to people and equipment. And I want to stress this because performance management means many different things at different levels of an organization, at different activities. Um, to to uh, a lot of people who operate in the engineering world, in the production world, uh, performance management is asset performance management. It's like, I want to improve the, the performance of these assets, of these physical pieces of equipment, this production line, uh, this, this, this batch system, this processing plant. Yet, when I take a look at other systems out there, other activities, we're talking about personnel performance management. You know, so there are two different aspects to performance management that need to be considered. So the, the goal of this uh, is really to improve or create the environment where people and equipment can perform to the best of their abilities. And that's really what the key is. Um, we need to do this independent of uh, the levels of activities that show up inside the facility, inside a facility at all. Uh, we need to look at basically everything in the enterprise, not just the people, not just the equipment, but all the pieces in the enterprise. So what is total automation then, if we want to look at this, okay? Uh, total automation is an all-inclusive approach to the entire process automation strategy. Now, when I say process automation strategy, again, this means different things at different levels because we're implementing and executing processes at all levels of an organization, all the way down from the processes that occur in the boardrooms, all the way down to the processes that occur on the factory floors and in production. There is an effort 
in the IT world called hyper automation that is going on. It's an IT initiative to increase the automation of business processes uh, using artificial intelligence, machine learning, and a robotic process automation. And again, another term that has different meanings at different levels of the organization. When we say robotic process automation in hyper automation, we're talking about pieces of software that replicate and do repetitive tasks so you don't have to do it. That's not the robots that we see on the factory floor that are actually moving around and causing things to happen. So we have to be careful sometimes when we talk about the uh, activities that cross all these boundaries, et cetera. So uh, this is total automation is really the step beyond that, okay? It allows for those performance management activities at all levels of the enterprise. So it's a combination of IT, hyper automation, the process automation that uh, a lot of us in the engineering world understand and know what we're talking about, uh, sensor automation. And again, this is a, a, a different level, a lower level of the activities that go on because the sensor automation is uh, talking about the uh, the maintenance, the calibration, the error detection, et cetera, that goes on to sensors. And then OT task automation. Now, if you're not familiar with it, uh, the concept of OT is called operational technology to differentiate it from IT, which is information technology. Operational technology are those aspects of, of uh, IT that apply to actually controlling physical equipment to controlling people to actually doing real-time activities okay uh the so the total automation is really using some of the new uh technologies that are out there in a real-time environment uh generative ai for example uh the large language models the neural nets uh, using these things in the either the OT task automation or the process automation that, that is going on. So total automation is automating everything inside a factory. Well, why do we even automate these things? And we automate these things for the, a couple of reasons. And typically we have talked about uh, in, in the industry, three D problems, uh, but really there's five as near as I can see it. We automate processes so that we can improve them if they're dangerous. If we want, we use automation to remove people from those dangerous environments or situations that show up. Um, the, this is very much used in the process industries uh, and at the lower levels of the activities. We use it where it's dirty because we wanna remove people from environments that are dirty or can impact their health. Another reason we use it is it's demanding. It's demanding full attention for somebody over an extended period of time. And, uh, you know, bottom line is, uh, you know, the way our brains work, we use up energy on it. And over extended periods of time, uh, we lose our attention. Our attention just disappears. So we use automation to remove people from tasks where they're basically going to get tired and they can't apply their full attention over periods of time. Um, an example of this one, think of an automated pilot uh, uh, system, in an automated flight system inside an airplane. There's full attention required over extended periods of time, hours and hours, uh, maybe 10 hours. Um, but we use automation to eliminate uh, the, the activity of requiring full attention because people will burn out after so many hours. Another reason we use automation is where, is where things are very delicate, where it requires more dexterity or precision that can be performed by people. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard stories of the robots that are used now for many surgeries as an example of that, which, where the uh, surgeons or the doctors will be manipulating uh, the robots, but the robots are operating on a scale that is very much smaller than they could actually physically operate on where you're talking about millimeters of, of uh, movement instead of what our big fingers have to do. Um, that's automation which required dexterity or precision, but there are others as well uh, that require that. Uh, so we use a lot of automation there because we can use the robotics associated with it. And then the last one, the last of the five big D problems are dull. We use it to remove people from tasks that are rep repetitive and dull. 
leading to that loss of focus and inability to solve problems. Um, these are the sort of things that show up oftentimes in inspection systems when you're looking for some, some problem associated with a, with a line. And if people were looking at it, they're going to lose their focus at some point in time and it's not going to help you. You know, you're going to be missing things. Well, a lot of people think total automation and all that is a lights out factory. So what I have here is a picture of a lights out factory. Um, can't see very much in there. And uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's the total vision that people have, but that's really not what it is. Uh, that's not how systems actually work today. It's not that you walk into a factory, there is nobody there. Uh, things are just happening. Uh, you can't really see it. You don't know what the, you don't have any visibility into it. Uh, th these aren't things. Um, these are, there are more processes that go on inside a factory than just the assembly or the disassembly or the mixing, et cetera, in a, in a manufacturing operation. So uh, what we need to do is really look at it. And what we look at it in total automation is that we will have people walking around looking at stuff. Uh, we will have activities that go on at a higher level in what we can call the back office, for lack of a better term, or the, the top office, on top of a manufacturing facility uh, where they are performing tasks relating to scheduling, uh, relating to the dispatching, the uh, uh, tracking of the resources that they're using, these sort of things that are going on. These activities themselves can also be automated. And that's what total automation is. I'll explain that and talk about that in a little bit. But we also have the people walking around in the facility itself. And the reason we're doing that is when we talk about total automation, we talk about uh, optimizing the performance of those systems. Um, we can look at the things that are known or expected and we can program in solutions to it. The problem that shows up is when we have unexpected problems, unknown problems, uh, what do you have to do? You have to have some people there. So if you go to any uh, place today, you will see uh, that there any facility today, any factory today, you'll see people walking around. They're looking for things that are going wrong that they have to solve because they haven't shown up before. You couldn't do machine learning on them because you didn't, you've never seen it before. So there's no machine learning on it. Um, you, you can't program in a solution because it was un totally unexpected. So we have people walking around, but we also have people walking around doing things where it doesn't pay to actually do any automation. And, and many times I've seen these in factories where you have manual addition of materials because it's just, you know, it doesn't happen often enough. It's hard to, justify the expense of, of a, a robot or robotic system when somebody can do the task in about two minutes. It's just, it's just not worth it, but they have to know what kind of task that they are trying to do. So uh, the goal here on total automation is not a lights out factory. It's not that there is nothing, uh, you can't see what's going on. Um, there was a, an example of this in, in a, a Tom Cruise movie called, uh, minority report where he's in they're being chased through this factory building cars and there's nobody in the factory except the people being chased and the cars are being made um, that's probably never going to happen because there are activities that require people inside there at the very least to figure out that there's a problem uh, going on so what are these activities and here i i will have to uh, uh, go and start talking about the ISA 95 models because that's uh, what I've been working on for many years. Uh, and these, uh, the standard there, the ISA 95 standard talks about different activities that occur. These are not architectural models. These are not architectural levels. These are really levels associated with the activities that go on, the time frame of those activities and the skill sets required for it. So up in level four, the, the business processing and logistics, that's where hyper automation uh, shows up uh, inside the inside the uh, the model. And basically that hyper automation is the automating of the scheduling, the production ordering, the supply chain management uh, sort of systems that go on. I'm not going to talk about those. Uh, 
At the lower level, we talk about sensor and actuator automation, and that's uh, you know automated calibration, automated cleaning, automated alignment, automated error detection. Those are automated systems, whereas in the past, they have always been manual. Somebody has to go out and check the calibration. Somebody has to check the cleaning of the system. Now we're getting very smart sensors that are that are doing these things themselves. They are, they've got their own procedures in there. They'll tell you when there's a problem. Um, that, so they have their own levels of automation. Uh, process automation has been around forever. This is the sort of things that are used in uh, PLCs, programmable logic controllers and DCSs, distributed control systems. These are the systems that actually control the equipment at the lower level, that run the, the, the uh, uh, maintain the control, provide the information uh, available for monitoring. Uh, the one I really wanna focus on is the OT task automation, what's called manufacturing operations management, because these are the activities that go on inside a facility that really, uh, do the scheduling of the systems that do the tracking of materials through the systems. Total automation is all of these together. So let me just show you uh, briefly a little bit what we mean about the OT side of it. Uh, the top part of it in green is from the ISA 95 standard. The lower parts are parts that I have added to it to kind of show how all these pieces fit together. Above this is the level four systems. Above this is the scheduling, the plant scheduling that says, here's what I want you to make. And then these activities here in the green, this is how it, we convert that schedule, that demand with the appropriate resources all the way down to the sensors and actuators to turn on the motors, to open the valves, uh, to turn on the machines that we have down there. And in each of those cases, uh, when we look at what is required for automation, we see at the lowest level, it's dangerous, dirty, delicate, or dull. Um, at the level two things, they're demanding, they're delicate, and they're dull. dull. Uh, it's, control itself can be very delicate. Uh, at the top level, they're demanding and basically dull. So they are an opportunity for us to do automation. Now, the, what we've got in the, the 95 and the IEC versions of it, the ISO versions of it, is each of these activities is really detailed in a process, formally or informally. And when you look at every company that's out there, they have procedures and policies for each of the activities out there, whether it's data collection or dispatching, et cetera. And they do it in production. They do it in inventory management and movement of systems throughout warehouses, uh, in inline and online testing, and even in, in uh, predictive maintenance control. So we cover all of those activities that show up inside a manufacturing facility, these are the places where we want to apply automation to the system so that we can do the performance management. Because in order to do performance management, we need to collect information. So we need to collect the information that requires some sort of human involvement. Uh, the asset performance management that I mentioned before already is, um, uh, being used. There's a lot of that currently going on. Uh, so the concept of uh, performance management and activities with human intervention, one of the concepts here is a digital com companion. That has started in the medical field today. It provides personalized help and assistance to somebody. That could be to a patient, that could be to a nurse, that could be to a doctor, um, it, it, but it's a companion in the sense that it's a digital assistant that helps them perform the tasks that they need to do, particularly those that are demanding and or dull, because if they're demanding, it helps to remind them what they're supposed to be doing. If they're dull, it can help them by uh, eliminating the repetitive tasks and doing it themselves. Well, we need the same sort of concept here. Um, we need a digital uh, assistant uh, for uh, the, the performance of the systems in the manufacturing operation space, either on the factory floor or in the production back office. We need to collect that information so that we can do performance management, so we can do performance improvements in our systems. Because again, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And that's what the key here is. So let's look about where we want to be a couple years in the future 
of performance management. Well, one of the things we want to do is we want to know how well we're doing. So um, this is one uh, that I looked at and basically it said, okay, we've got in our assets, we've got a thing called OEE, uh, Operational Equipment Efficiency. Well, in looking at people, we need a kind of a similar sort of thing. Um, now, OEE is really great because you, you're shooting for 100%, but um, I'm one of those people that I don't think 100% is good enough. <laughs> so what we're talking about here is the personal productivity effectiveness, which is the uh, your task completion ratio. How many tasks were you assigned to do and how many uh, completed correctly? And what was the time that you were supposed to do it? So you take your task completed, you subtract off how many required repeats. So I filled in this form, I made a mistake, I got to do it again, et cetera. Uh, and then how much time did it take to do it? A hundred percent should be the minimal. If you're doing under a hundred percent, that means that you're, you're either making mistakes or you're not providing enough time for it. If you're over a hundred percent, it means you are doing better than expected. Uh, but we need to be able to measure these things. We need to, that, to measure it in such a way that uh, it's automated because we don't want people writing down how much time they're going to be doing something and, and uh, writing down what their schedule was and trying to integrate it all together. So in order to calculate our, our efficiency or effectiveness, uh, we need this little digital assistant, you know, kind of something that kind of looks over your shoulder and basically say it manages your tasks, it makes reminders, it brings up relevant information. Uh, it records the completion of these tasks. It walks you through any manual steps that you may have to process. It collects information from equipment and it's truly mobile because remember, these are the people walking around through a facility looking at uh, what's going on. Uh, today, most of these activities that go on uh, are taught there are SOPs, standard operating uh, procedures or standard operating uh, uh, policies that people were supposed to learn. And then when they go out and do their work, they're supposed to remember that and then go off and do it. Well, in our increasingly complicated world, many people in the facilities are doing multiple different tasks and they got to try and remember all this. So the whole idea of a digital assistant is to make that information available just as it's needed at just the right time in just the right place. If I walk up to a piece of equipment and I need to do something to it, then my assistant should be able to know exactly where I am and what is supposed to be done on that. It should be personal, not necessarily used for malicious management to say, hey, you know, I'm tracking you. Um, we even have a name for what this digital assistant should be, it should be our mom, manufacturing operations management, mom looking over our shoulder. Um, but it's a personal version of it. Now, today, when you look at uh, MES systems or MOM systems, uh, they're not necessarily personal. And in many cases, they're sitting, you're sitting in front of a screen doing some information. It's loaded with tasks and schedules for lots of different people not necessarily focused on just what you need to be doing and not necessarily focused on the mistakes that you have made so that it will remind you not to make those mistakes again. So this is the sort of thing that I think is going to come up in the next five years or 10 years as, as we get more and more of the capability of the mobile systems available. I mean, today I can almost do it on my phone, uh, those sort of things that uh, it, has many of the things that I would need to recognize where I am because they've got cameras on there. They can scan machines. It's got a way to communicate directly to me. It can record completions and tasks and walk-ups. So the, the concept in the future is I'm going to have an assistant. It's going to do the automation things for the things that primarily are dull or very delicate or demanding themselves. It, it improves my performance by giving me feedback because that's what it takes in order to, to improve performance. Um, it's a, it tells me who tasks dispatch to people in the right place with the right training and availability. Don't today, many times in, in, uh, in some systems, uh, there'll be a task out there, but you can't guarantee that the person who is performing that task has actually been trained and has the availability to do it. Now, in some industries, particularly in the life science industries, pharmaceutical and biotech industries, uh, there are checks in there. 
but in many, many other industries, there are very few checks to make sure that the right people have the training to do something. It identifies when it's to be done and or priority of the task to actually be done. Uh, it relates those tasks to other tasks so you can understand the consequences. Let's say, if I don't do this task, that means five minutes from now, this entire production line will shut down. Or if I don't do this task, that means tomorrow uh, we're going to uh, overflow uh, and, and we're going to have to do uh, overtime to make sure people work. It may specify how to perform the task. It may walk me through the steps and it would capture exactly what was done when those tasks were, how long they took, what the consequences of the tasks are. It's a little digital assistant sitting with you. Everyone would have one of these. You would walk into your facility. You could be doing this on a screen. You could be walking around the facility, but you will have one of these things helping you, reminding you of the things that today you have to remember yourself and you have to remember across a wide range of activities that are going on. So it'll be riding in your pocket, takes care of all the dull tasks, Remind you of the tasks requiring attention, which is the demanding part of it. Uh, it may, because of uh, artificial intelligence and the, the sort of things we have, it may be making suggestions to you, either to how to perform the tasks or even the order of tasks to be performed. Uh, it could easily come by, especially if you're in a facility and say, oh, by the way, do these first, because that way you don't have to walk over to the other side of the, of the production lines. You can get them done and then walk over. It'll provide the necessary documentation. Today, many times when you have to do a task you're not familiar with, uh, you will have to go look up the documentation, find the SOPs, uh, make sure they're available. This would be right available with you in your palm or writing in your pocket to show you exactly what you want to do. So we'll have the technologies in there, the heads up displays on the safety glasses that you wear that will be showing you that information. Uh, it'll increase your situational awareness in demanding tasks. That means you will be aware of what is going on and it will monitor these things for you. Um, very easy, uh, for example, to include in this um, a audio uh, awareness. Many times walking through a facility, you'll hear something and say something is wrong. These machines are not working the way they should be working. The sound is wrong. We today will recognize that, but we learn that over time. With a digital assistant, the digital assistant will learn that and then provide us with, with information that we may not have otherwise noticed because of all the other tasks we're doing. Records our, our PPE for personal improvements and then will focus on, on the activities uh, of really what we call the, the ISA level three, two and one activities that are going on inside a facility. Uh, and that will help us do the performance management for all the lower level activities below what we call the hyper automation systems that are going on. So we can see this, this is my vision of it, where we're going to be in five to 10 years. We're all gonna have assistance where they will be providing us the information we need. We're gonna carry those things around. Uh, they will give us that capability of making the improvements. We already know that as we move to uh, the MES type systems or the manufacturing execution systems, that we get a couple percent of improvement per year in productivity. These sort of things will also continue that effort as we move more and more to people monitoring machines rather than running machines, as people move to monitoring activities rather than actually performing the activities. This is where I think we're going to be. This is, I think, how we're going to be making our improvements in the future of uh, uh, performance management. So I wanna say thank you very much uh, for this. And if you have any questions or comments about this, uh, please feel free to put it into the uh, comments chat uh, associated with this and we will uh, answer those questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Dennis, for your interesting lecture. Uh, it's so interesting that I see you already received one question from the LinkedIn audience. So I'm going to read it. Uh, the first uh, question comes from Pierluigi Turiziani, who is a supply chain director of Gucci. He kindly 
uh, wrote, good morning and thank you for this amazing initiative. One question, what are the mandatory prerequisites to implement and successfully run automation? Of course, reliable data, maybe stable processes, even if AI can help to manage variances. Yeah. What else, in your opinion? Thank you in advance for sharing your thoughts. Yeah, so one of the, uh, I think, mandatory prerequisites for this, well, obviously there's there's a, a set of IT infrastructure, but I want to deal with the other thing, the, the information content. Today, many manufacturing facilities run so well that it's difficult to use AI and machine learning to figure out what is happening when something goes wrong because things don't go wrong. We have control systems in place that are designed specifically to prevent things from going out, out, of, uh, out of range. Um, but we do have systems in place that actually do that. Today, those are the training systems that we use inside the factories, inside the uh, automation systems, where we're teaching uh, uh, the uh, operators and we're teaching the people inside the facility how things run without actually doing the real system. And those systems will often do the uh, uh, cause the problems, you know, create issues. Much as when you're doing a flight simulator and, and you're learning how to fly, it's not like you're learning how to fly when everything's going right. You want to learn how to fly when things are going wrong. So if we take our AI, if we take our machine learning and apply the machine learning not against the real system and the real data, well, we will do that to see what normal is, but against our training systems to see what the responses are to known problems, uh, then they can react. So you have to have training systems or digital twins associated with your manufacturing facilities. You have to be able to drive those to unsafe behavior so that you can train your systems on how to do this and so that you know you have your procedures and policies in place to handle those sort of things. So that's what I think you really absolutely have to have. Digital twins active digital twins that have simulation systems behind them. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so uh, if Luigi, you have other comments you can add on LinkedIn. And also if there are any other questions from the audience, uh, this will be very welcome. Uh, you can type them directly as a comment on LinkedIn or YouTube. Uh, and I will read to the keynote speaker. Uh, in the meantime, while waiting for possible other questions, I have one. Yes. Uh, as I said, your lecture has been very, very interesting. Oh, in the meantime, I see another question come, came, uh, but I'll go with mine. Uh, how do you envision the role of humans in a fully automated manufacturing enterprise? And what steps can be taken to ensure that automation is used to enhance human capabilities rather than replace them? Yes. Well, people will always be there because we can deal much more easily with totally unexpected situations where uh, because uh, we have a, a whole lifetime of experience that we can tend to draw upon it. Uh, whereas today, and probably for the next few years, the artificial intelligence, the machine learning are still very focused in scope. You know, they, would, they will recognize the problems that they understand that they have been trained on. But we as humans have been trained on much broader scope. So we have, I hate to say common sense, but because it is not so common <laughs> in many places, but uh, uh, we have common sense so we can start to apply that. So that means that the humans become, we become monitors, we become managers rather than executors of the systems that are outside in place. And, and I believe that will help us as we move forward. And that's where the concept of this digital assistant is to, to give us the information so that we can do that. I noticed that we have one other question. Um, how do you think factors related to total automation can be combined with topics regarding operational ex excellence and technologies such as virtual reality, augmented, augmented reality, or digital twin? I believe these, the uh, particularly the virtual reality on, uh, and the digital twin will definitely show up because we need those sort of things to help train our systems. The augmented reality, that's actually already showing up inside facilities where people have uh, safety glasses or safety shields that are displaying information to them. Um, many times these are people who have to go out to, 
to places uh, like uh, oil refineries and uh, uh, where they're very far away from any screen. And it will call up information about equipment as they look at it. So they look at a pump, they'll say, oh, there's information on the pump, what's its tag number, what's the temperature, et cetera, and, and, and when was it last uh, managed. So uh, these are the sort of things they will all be used. Uh, uh, as we move forward, we're going to have the digital twins, we're going to have the virtual reality and the augmented reality. Those will all be integrated, I believe, in with our assistants. So it'll say, oh, by the way, if you make this change, this is going to happen. So don't make that change. Yeah. Yeah, I see. In the meantime, uh, Pierluigi added, uh, Pierluigi Turiziani added some comments. It's uh, thank you, Dennis and Alessandra. And also, I would love to think about AI as augmented intelligence uh, or rather than artificial. Okay. That's actually mind? really good. That's a, that's a great thing. It's augmented intelligence yeah. rather than artificial. Yes. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. I hope you all have a, a great conference and a great rest of the day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you uh, for being here and for your interesting, very, very interesting lecture. Okay, uh, now um, it's time to move uh, to the second keynote. Uh, let's see if he arrived, if he connected. Um, Andrea, okay, good morning, Andrea. Uh, thank you for being here. I will present Andrea uh, to the audience. Um, Andre uh, Andrea Franzetti Coladon is a university professor and a business advisor and coach. Specifically, he is associate professor of business management and analytics at the University of Perugia in Italy, where he is also the head of the business and collective intelligence lab. Andrea offers consulting and unique learning experiences on topics such as uh, social network analysis and text mining, change management, problem solving, design thinking, Thank leaders, you. leadership and business strategy, and much, much more. Moreover, Andrea is part of the core team of the Center for Collective Intelligence at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And today he will present as a lecture titled From Noise to Meaning, measuring honest signals to unlock talent and drive business success. So Andrea Fronzetti Coladon, it's a pleasure to have you here at Copperman 2023. Now I leave you the stage and you will have the next 30 minutes for your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. Thank you for having me. Let me go to the presentation mode. Do you see the slides? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you again for having me. And it's a pleasure to participate to this conference on performance management. And uh, I'm very happy to share some insights um, about what we do. Uh, while reflecting and researching on performance uh, in the era of big data. So how to measure and to manage performance, looking at things like networks, the power of words, and how to measure people on a signals. So um, how to use this kind of tools in the era of big data to unlock talent and drive business success. So this is the topic, but um, indeed, I would like to start uh, with a question. I would like all of us to stop for a moment and think, have you ever regretted using words without care? So it happened to me very frequently to use words without care and to regret the use of words that I made in the past. And that happened because I forgot that words were originally magic. You know that when the language developed in ancient times, words were used by wizards, by sorcerers. They were used to perform rituals. They were used to make magical formulas. Just a few people, a few wise people knew words. And they were using them to talk to the gods, to heal other people. Well, Freud, and we agree with him, was maintaining that um, nowadays words retained much of their ancient original power. 
By using words, for example, we can make somebody blissfully happy or we can drive them to despair. So, for example, on a partner, it's very different the behavior that you would get in return if you tell them I hate you or if you tell them I love you. And so the way we use words can really make the difference. They can make the difference like in the story of the blind man, for example. There is this story of a blind man asking for money and the blind man is outside of a pretty big mall and he's asking for money and he, he has a label in his hands. And on this label, it is written, please help me with an offering because I really, I cannot see. And so it's hard for me to find a job. So what happened one day is that uh, one important manager in marketing was passing by the mall and he saw the man and he read the label and he thought, okay, I don't have any coins now, but I go, I do some shopping and then I will give him an offering. And this is what he actually did. So he went into the mall he did some shopping and after two hours he came out and he was ready with a two euro coin to give it to the man. But he realized that the man's basket was still empty. So giving him two euros wouldn't solve the problem. Okay, so he started observing the man, he started watching the man and after 15 minutes watching, he realized that the man wasn't even in a blind spot. So people was, were actually passing by and they were reading the label, and they, but they were not giving any money. So what he did, he went back to the mall. He spent the two euros to buy a big blue marker and he came back to the man. He took his label, he turned it on the other side and on the other side of, his la uh, of this label, he wrote, today, it is the first day of spring, and I cannot see it. And then he observes the man, and he observes the behavior of people passing by, and immediately noticed that uh, a lot of more people uh, are giving coins, and so the man's basket is getting full very quickly. So the way we use words, uh, can make the difference. It's not just what we say, but it's also how we say it. And the way we use words can really be a driver of performance. So in this regard, the question is, how do we see this difference? How do we know, for example, if in a company, our one manager is a good manager? Can we go around and ask employees if they are happy to work with their boss or can we go around and ask them how much they like their colleagues? Even if we make a survey and we reassure them that the survey is going to be anonymous, okay? We are never going to get an unbiased answer. We, we are never going to get the spontaneous expressions. It's, it's not what should be the answer in the era of big data. We, we believe that surveys nowadays cannot be the future. I've seen a company, I mean, I've been also working for a while with a company that had, on one of its products, they had more than 23 million customers and still they were trying to assess the equity of their brand by administering a survey to 800 customers. And when I, I mean, when I doubt that, they told me, oh, well, but the sample, it's very representative of our customer base. Okay, so mm, what we believe is that um, if we want to know what is the real behavior of citizens, for example, when they make a voting choice at the elections, or if we want to really know what's the real behavior of our employees or what's the behavior of customers, we cannot make fake environments where people, I mean, for example, putting customers in a room that represents a mall and look at their behavior while they are paid to do so and while they know of being monitored. What we want to do is we want to go to the jungle to see how the lion hunts. We don't want to go to the zoo. So what we understood in a couple of decades of research is that uh, we really have to measure people's honest signals. And honest signals were defined as patterns in how we interact with other people. 
And from the study of these patterns, we can reveal people's values, goals, attitudes, and intentions. So our research, um, also with the colleagues at the MIT, has been a lot focused on the measurement of these honor signals to boost performance, to boost individual and company growth. And in our studies, we discovered that honor signals can be effectively measured along four main dimensions. The first one being social structure. So we use a lot of social network analysis. We make these graphs where nodes are social actors and links among connecting dots, connecting nodes, represent relationships among them. And on these networks, we study central leaders, we study rotating leaders, we, we identify central connectors or boundary spanners, we identify roles of people who are knowledge brokers. So by looking at the patterns of interactions among people, we can get very useful insights into the measurement of honor signals. But then we should never forget that these networks, these interaction patterns, evolve over time. And so time becomes our second dimension of analysis. Time is also considered in terms of the timing of interaction. So for example, a simple indicator that is the time that I take to answer to an email, it's a very important indicator because it becomes a proxy of my commitment on a project and it becomes a proxy of the respect that I pay to the person who sent me the email. And similarly, the time that other people are taking to answer to my emails, it's a proxy of my hierarchical position in a company, for example, or the commitment that they have on my project or the respect that they pay to me. So time is the second dimension, but then there is another fundamental one that is that that comes from the idea that a lot of interactions, a lot of communications come with content. It can be the content of a speech of two employees having a break at the coffee machine, or it can be the content of an email, or it could be the content of the knowledge exchanged by employees on the online forum in a, on the intranet of a company. It can be any content. So we can analyze language, we can analyze words used, but more than that, it's not just uh, what people say, but it's really about how do they say that. And so it's really about the most powerful insights that come from when we analyze the relationships among words. Even just looking at not only the, the words that people use, but also how they put them together will reveal a lot of these people. We will allow us to, to do uh, a good profiling of them. And then for now, the last and fourth most important dimension in our opinion is that of tracking, for example, people who are being or uh, optimizing workers' interactions through the use of sensors. This can be body sensors, this can be environmental sensors, it could be the integration of the two, like, for example, using uh, sociometric badges from the MIT Media Lab. And through the use of these sensors, we can map the interactions of people in the physical space, their well being, their activation. We have apps for smartwatches, or we have other intelligence devices that can give us these useful metrics and insights. So I've been telling you about the importance of measuring honor signals along these four dimensions. Um, and so along these four dimensions, we, we developed a lot of methods and tools. I would have hundreds to share, but let me touch base only on a few of them, some of those that I think are the most important. And in this regard, um, we found that the most important insights come when we combine the study of words with the study of networks. And so sometimes we also build networks of words where we study relationships among words. And in some complex scenarios, in, 
in complex modern systems, it is very important to optimize interactions and communication altogether. Like in the network you are observing, you are observing the dynamic interactions of a medical team who in the US is performing a liver transplant on a newborn kid. It's a very complicated intervention and it requires optimized communication and interaction patterns also in the physical space to get good out outcomes on the patients. So one way to combine the study of words and networks is to build networks of words. So to look at not just at the meaning of a conversation, not just at the meaning of a speech, not just at the content, but also, again, at the relationship among words. And so we can build semantic networks. Networks that we can analyze with novel indicators that leverage the power of uh, social network analysis and text mining. One of these is um, the semantic brand score. And it's an indicator originally meant for uh, brand importance, for measuring brand importance and the memorability of a company's brand, for example, in the news or on social media. But this indicator can still be applied to many other fields, so it could be used to assess the importance of made in Italy against uh, made in Germany, for example, or it could be used uh, for assessing the power of seers or testimonials or political candidates because they could all be considered as brands. Okay, and the semantic brand score has three dimensions that prevalence is the frequency of the brand name used, but then we have diversity and connectivity, which are dimensions that tap into the relationships among words. And so we tap into the brand image, the uniqueness, and uh, I mean, numerosity of brands associations and their strategic value and the brokerage power. So the semantic brand score, it's a useful tool and I will also show you some applications in this presentation. Other tools are related to looking at the flow of people's communication and behavior. Because in our study of companies, we, we observed that top performing teams often show an intended synchronization. So uh, they enter in a state of flow. It's like, I mean, the best way to think about this is to think about jazz musician when they do a jam session and when they do improvisation, they really enter in a state of flow and they synchronize unintendedly. And so we have entanglement, for example, which is a measure of this in unintended synchronization within team in the communication patterns. And we see that when these teams are in a state of flow, when they synchronize, they can really deliver the better performance, the best performance. It's like um, for synchronization, often we need rotating leaders. Rotating leaders are people who can share their vision, they can share their knowledge, they can boost uh, the morale and the performance of a team, but they also have the ability to step back and leave space to others to, to keep going with the conversation. So they make community grow, they foster innovation, and they do not jeopardize the conversation. Because if we look at a social network, we will see that these people, they dance going from the periphery to the center of the social network back and forth. So a very brief recap, as I promised, on uh, methods and tools, just two or three of them. Um, I've been talking about the importance of honest signals, but what's the purpose? Um, what's the use of these metrics and measurements uh, that we can do in companies also to manage and increase performance? So just some examples here. The most straightforward, of course, is the measurement of brand importance and brand memorability and track the evolution of these metrics over time and compare our brands to competitors and apply this kind of uh, insights in marketing and when we study consumers' behavior or, or when we study uh, citizens' behavior at the elections, for example. 
But looking at the other side of the coin, we can also consider other uh, data sources. So, so it could be the communication among employees. It could be social media. If we look at consumers' behavior, it could also be the message sent by mainstream media. And so, for example, we have showed that looking just at online news and the words used on online newspapers, we can successfully forecast elections and we can have a proof of the influence that media have on citizens, as well as by looking at the words that media used related to the economy, we can forecast financial markets or we can forecast the consumer's confidence um, in the future of the economy or their households. If we take an internal view, if we look at email communication among managers or regular employees within a company, we can get similar insights. And so measuring on a signals, uh, even using the semantic brand score, for example, we can anticipate disengagement. So we can anticipate managers that will want to leave your company at least six, six months before they leave. And so you, you can, can think about the importance of anticipating disengagement, because, for example, if you have anticipating disengagement, let me say, even before these people consciously realize that they will want to leave your company because their in honest signals will change earlier than they consciously realize. And then, so if you are in the human resource department, you can really do something if you want to retain these people, as well as you can use honest signals to identify innovators. So the most innovative people within your company, those who can boost innovation in teams, or, or you can uh, profile people through the use of honest signals and make the best uh, new product development team by matching together the right kind of people. So profiling is another important use of these tools. And for example, we are now discover, discovering in our latest research that um, you should also try to profile your employees based on their moral values, because morality and ethical values are connected to business performance. On this metaphor, we, we compare people to leeches, ants, and bees, and we find that each one of us is a little bit um, one of the three or more of the three. So if you are mostly a leech, we, it means that you care only for your own goods and you are mostly selfish and immoral. But then we have a lot of people who are more of an ant, and so ants uh, people are employees, are citizens who follow the rules. They follow the rules of their in-group, so they are moral because they are told to do the right thing and then they do uh, what they are told to do. It's like soldiers executing prisoners if they are told that executing prisoners is the right thing to do. So we say they are moral because they are following the norms of the, their in-group. And then we have more exceptional people. These are this we call bees, because the bees are not only moral, they are ethical in the sense that they care for a greater good. They sometimes break the group norms because they have this vision of a greater good. It's like Anton Schmidt in the German army when he managed to save more than 300 Jews from the Bonary massacre. So he was breaking the rules of the German army to save people, people's lives. Well, I can reveal that in terms of performance, it's not always the best to be a B. So in terms of being rewarded for individual performance, it, it is sometimes better to be an ant. But we really need, need Bs when our groups are doing creativity and they are working on innovation. And we really need bees to boost group performance. Similarly, because then once we have all this informative power of honest signals, we should try to make a good use of that. So similarly, we can uh, use honest signals to fight crime. We have applications to identify 
people or companies that are more at risk of money laundering. So we can see that, um, for example, this kind of potential criminals, they, they do a higher brokerage across risky uh, economic transactions. So again, even in economic transactions, this is about studying relationships. Or jumping to another topic, we can optimize on a signals, we can optimize communication within the company or outside the company. So within a company, for example, we can op use honest signals to optimize the communication between the clients and employees to improve uh, customer satisfaction, to boost the net promoter score, if that is the metric that you use to measure customer satisfaction or on the other end we can we could optimize that is very important nowadays the message on the media and what the media are saying in order to change people behavior the power of communication is that if you use it in the right way you can change people behavior and so we can use the right words and put them together in the right way for example to push a clean energy transition. So let me come to the end um, of my presentation with an open question. I think it's an open question for every company manager or CEO and for everybody of us. So we discovered that if we show people how they're behaving, if we tell people what is their virtual behavior, for example, in email communication? We, if we give them what we call a virtual mirror on their behavior, then we can change these behaviors. But what should be our ultimate goal? Why do we want to do this? Why do we want to increase performance? We, we are talking in this conference about performance, but... Uh, is it individual performance? Is it group performance? Is it company performance? But why shall we boost it? I think that uh, if the answer is only one, so if the answer is only because we want to make higher profits, that could be a problem. That could be a problem for the evolution and future of our society. So, of course, uh, profit is a good goal of a company and it's one of the most important goals of a company, but we should look beyond profits. We can use virtual mirroring, we can use um, this kind of tools to trigger self-reflection, to unlock talent and to make people go, go beyond their limits so we can boost um, personal group and company growth. And we think that the ultimate goal of everybody should be the betterment of humankind. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Andrea, uh, for your stimulating lecture, also for your nice way to present these uh, innovative concepts. I really believe they have strong value and also importance for real companies. Uh, in the meantime, I see you already received uh, some questions from the audience and I'm going to read them. Uh, however, before reading the questions, I want to recall to the other listeners that if they want to make any question, uh, provide curiosities, comments, anything, they can type them as a comment under the live streaming, streaming videos on LinkedIn or YouTube and I will read them to the keynote speaker. Okay, so let's go to the first question. Uh, first question is, uh, thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, one question, <laughs> what are the honest signals and how can they be used to measure performance in a manufacturing enterprise? How do you differ from, how do they differ from traditional survey-based approaches? Okay, thank you. And thank you also for the interesting question. So honest signals are something that we cannot measure through surveys. Uh, it's something that often people are not aware of because they are mm, kind of spontaneous and subconscious behavior 
and interactions dynamics that we put in practice while we interact with other people. So, for example, is um, the turn taking in a discourse, how much we interrupt each other and how, how much we build knowledge on our communication is the time we take in the interaction. So how much time do we take to answer to an email? How many times do we ping other people on a project if they are not doing their work? But it could also be, if we use sensors, the acceleration of our body. I mean, we have been doing that regarding manufacturing or, well, that application was in a logistic hub. And so we were using sensors to see um, how fast and in which directions uh, people were moving in the physical space if they were interacting one with the other, if these interactions were boosting performance or they were detrimental to performance, if the supervision of a boss uh, in the logistic hub was a good thing or a bad thing. So honest signals are things that uh, you measure with social network analysis, you measure looking at, for example, in a communication network, you could also look at the brokerage knowledge power of some people. So how can these people bring knowledge in and outside your company? So these are metrics that are even difficult to explain in simple words. But what we do later, so in the virtual mirroring process, you take company because every con context is different. So you, you see the behavior of top performing people and you measure their honest signals in terms of networks and language use. And then you calibrate your models to make a forecast. So what you do, then you translate this knowledge into very, very simple presentation and terms. And you do coaching sessions with these people and you tell them, you are a knowledge broker or you are a rotating leader or this is your timing in uh, conversations and they didn't know about it so you make them reflect on their virtual or um, unvirtual <laughs> behavior and triggering change in this way uh, they will change their behavior and performance boosting will be uh, a consequence of these actions Thank you for this answer. Um, I, uh, I will move to reading the second question. Uh, second question is, uh, thank you very much for your interesting presentation, thank Professor Franzetti. Can you please provide some more details uh, on the dimension of the semantic brand score? Yeah, so the first dimension of the semantic brand score is prevalence, which is what everybody is meant measuring every any company that is doing social media analysis for example and looking at a brand name or looking on news sometimes they call it mentions sometimes they call it um coverage okay and it's how frequently a brand name is measured and mentioned but that is not enough in our view because that indicator doesn't consider relationship among words in the semantic network so we, we need to include diversity and diversity is uh, the number and uniqueness of the brand associations. And so what makes a brand distinctive from the others? So for example, I could have 1000 tweets mentioning the, the brand Telecom Italia and we say, thank you Telecom Italia. But if this is repeated 1000 times, it, it's just a trivial message. It's not adding a lot to the conversation. If we have another company like Wind that it's mentioned uh, a lower number of times, like 600 times, but in a rich discourse, that brand would have higher diversity and higher associations, which will attach to the memory nodes of readers. Okay. And then connectivity, it is still connected to the concept of associations because it's how much a brand can be a connection point, a bridge between different topics and different knowledge in the discourse. And so connectivity, if you know of um, social network analysis, you would measure it with uh, between a centrality, weighted between a centrality. Thank you, thank you. I also have a personal curiosity. Um, my question is, uh, 
let's say you recognize the signals and attitudes by people uh, and you measure inequity in companies. Uh, how to find okay. countermeasures and how to put them in practice in real contexts? So, um, what do you mean by inequity? I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, that's part of the question. I mean, let's say you measure through sensors on the body, as you showed on human bodies, or through all the methods that you provided us. You know, let's say you measure signals that are not, uh, that should be changed, as you were saying before, no? Uh, how to change it, how to put in practice, uh, and how to convince people in, in, in having a change. Yeah. So we find that in most of cases, uh, first of all, we, we never point our fingers towards um, specific people. So we try to provide uh, group level performance measurements and uh, company level performance measurements. And when we need to give um, a negative or a general personalized feedback to, to people, even if it's not negative, we tend to do that in private. So we tend to show people what they are doing good publicly, publicly because that becomes an example for all people to follow. Okay, for all employees. And then for correcting people in, in private, uh, what we usually do is we do these coaching sessions and, and well, we also teach and do change management. And so we, we tap on the pragmatics of human communication. But the most important thing is that a lot of these people, the majority of them, they are maybe blocked in their talent or they cannot perform uh, at the best of their possibilities because they are not aware of many of their behaviors so they just behave so they they just behave using recurring patterns but they do not even consciously realize so already when you show them how they are behaving and you give them simple tips like be less complicated in the communication with the client, trying to answer faster, to have one person that is a reference and without changing the reference person every time and try to, I mean, the customer already knows that you have a lot of knowledge. So you don't need to show them that knowledge in the emails, okay? You just need to solve their problem quickly. Just giving these very few tips but together with the fact that we show them that maybe they sent over complicated email with a metric and they couldn't realize themselves, then this usually triggers self-reflection and boost, uh, boosts change. And so we observe change and we observe, uh, for example, improvement in customer satisfaction or in company revenues. Okay, thank you. That's very interesting for me. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let's wait. Do, do you have from the audience any other comment or question? I guess no comments, but Mario Caterino says, thank you very much for your answer. Okay. I see. Let's wait another second. Okay. No, I see that questions are ended. So thank you, Andrea, very much for being here. Uh, Thanks a lot. It seems we are perfectly. Yeah, thank you very much. It seems we are perfectly on time according to our scheduling. Some minutes uh, on delay, but I mean, that's not uh, a problem. So now let's have a short break, short coffee break before moving to the presentation of the manuscripts and authors that have been selected for Copperman 2023. This break will last around 30 minutes, maybe more, a little bit less. So we will be back on streaming here at 11 a.m. Stay tuned and see you later.
Okay, uh, welcome back to Copperman 2023. We have already had two interesting keynote speeches by Dennis Brandl and Andrea Fronzetti Colladon. We thank again them for joining us. Now, after a short coffee break, we are ready to move to the second part of Copperman 2023. Uh, in this part, different authors selected by international countries will present and discuss their innovative researchers on the topic of measuring and managing organizational performance in modern business environments. Each author will have 15 minutes available to present his work, followed by a short Q&A session. Uh, the first, actually, the first work that was supposed to be presented was titled the Situation Awareness Monitoring by Behavior Detection and Models Process Retroaction for Crew Member of Nuclear Power Plant. However, I see that the authors of this work are not joining us. Maybe they have connection problems or I don't know. Uh, so uh, we will have a, a small change of program. Uh, and we will show a video of another presenter. Uh, we will uh, actually show the video of the researchers that last year joined Copperman and that were awarded by the scientific committee for the interesting presentation. So let's start with the video of the presentation. Uh, if we... My name is Joshua and I will be presenting uh, the paper titled Discrete Event Simulation as a Remote Decision-Making Tool for Improving Overall Line Efficiency. This paper is co-authored by uh, Yong Wen Yao and myself. So a bit about the background of this research. Um, what is decision-making? Decision-making is actually uh, evaluating several options to determine which option is the best one to be chosen. So when we talk about decision making, it's important we choose a viable tool that enables us to evaluate among the alternatives. So uh, ever since the pandemic began, uh, remote working are extensively adopted. In addition to that, uh, most companies are encouraging uh, the use of software attributed to this remote decision, uh, remote working. However, there is a lack of a comprehensive framework on integrating simulation with decision making, especially for remote working in the context of process improvement. Therefore, the aim of this paper is to test the feasibility of a new decision making framework for system performance improvement. We achieve this aim through the objective which is to develop and validate the new framework through a case study. Uh, a bit about the scope of this research. Uh, discrete Event Simulation or DES was used as a decision making tool, Minitab was used to analyze the result and this case study was conducted at a packaging manufacturing company in Malaysia. So we have done two literature reviews. The first review is on decision making tools. Based on the review, uh, most companies uh, prefer not to adopt analytical and mathematical model because of the complexity involved. However, uh, DES is frequently used because uh, simulation models are relatively easy to construct. Next, this, uh, for a further review was conducted to evaluate the components of a framework. It can be seen that uh, most frameworks are not comprehensive enough to include all the necessary steps it requires. So therefore, the aim of this paper is to include all the steps that we have reviewed so far to form a comprehensive framework that will enable remote decision making to be carried out, carried out successfully. So uh, this is the layout of the framework. As you can see, there are three uh, stages. The top represents the stage the middle represents the objective and the bottom white boxes represents the steps involved to achieve the objectives. So now I will go through one by one for each stage involved. Firstly, the initiation stage. The objective of this stage is to understand the problem and direction 
of the case study company. So the steps involved basically are understanding the system, identify the problems, set performance benchmark, define goals, objectives, and criteria weights for the decision elements. Next, in the modeling stage, the objective of this stage is to build simulation model to imitate the system. The steps involved are collecting data from the system, building a simulation model, as well as verify and validating the model. In the analysis stage, the objective is to generate relevant solutions. This can be done by performing root cause analysis with the aid of the simulation model construct previously and identify area to be prioritized for improvement. Solutions are generated to, sell, to solve the relevant root causes and this is then uh, performed via design of experiment. A simulation model of the solutions that are feasible are constructed and attribute values are designated. After the simulation run, ANOVA analysis is performed and uh, performance measures of each decision criterion are normalized to obtain an overall performance score. Based on this, the one that gives the best overall performance score is selected. Finally, a course of action plan for the implementation is developed based on the selected best overall performance. Now for the case study. Uh, this case study was conducted in a packaging manufacturing company. A bit of background about this company. It is a job shop make to order there are six workstations and six product types involved based on uh, production control reports there are few observations about this uh, specific uh, production area that is selected namely uh, there is a congested wip area and large amount of waste based on financial reports as well there are undesired costs such as overtime allowances and penalty for late delivery and poor uh, poor, poor product quality Therefore, uh, in setting the performance benchmark, OLE or overall line efficiency was selected. The goal is to improve the OLE by at least 15%. It is good to be informed that OLE bears similarity to OEE, but this is specifically for the context of a manufacturing line instead of just a machine. To, uh, on top of that, to seek for solutions, that is effective in attaining goal, effective in diminishing costs and reducing waste and late delivery, as well as to incur minimum time and cost for implementation. The decision criteria involved are OLE, scrap rate, flow time, level of difficulty or OLE, as well as equipment cost effectiveness, ECE. All these are selected as the performance criteria. It is good to note that these performance criteria are selected based on the objectives to be achieved. Next, uh, weights are assigned to each of the criteria based on inputs from various levels of the organization such as managers and production control personnel. The score and the description for all the scores assigned for the weights are as seen in the table shown. Next, in the modeling stage, a simulation data was constructed. Prior to this, data collection for the work cycle time, a work element time, cycle time of the machine, as well as the weight of scrap, uh, scrap generated was collected. Uh, the total data that was collected was worth one full working day. Based on all this data collected, the simulation was then constructed with a warm up time of 6,000 hours and a runtime of 2160 hours, which corresponds to three months. Next, the verification of the simulation model. The parameter chosen for verification, uh, the validation is the, is the line scrap rate. Based on the actual line scrap rate collected from the production floor and the simulated data, there is a difference of 12.93%, which is less than the acceptable 15%. Aside from this, verification to test for the correctness of the model is also proven. Next, the analysis 
Based on the simulation model, it was observed that the printer and the corrugator are two systems that face uh, issues. Namely, the inefficient printer setup model, which corresponds to <coughs> quality check form, single mini expert. Quality check form, single mini exchange die, and in increasing the setup of worker, which are potential solutions. For low throughput rate at the printing workstation, potential solutions are increasing machine and revising the job scheduling rule. Next, poor troubleshooting for poor troubleshooting skills, potential solutions are improving the troubleshooting skills of the op operator. So based on this, a supplementary simulation model was built for each of these potential solutions, namely one simulation model for the printer and one simulation model for the corrugator. Based on the simulation model that was constructed, the input values for the future simulation model was able to be generated. In enhancing pre, uh, printer setup efficiency, uh, the setup times and the number of setups that were to be performed were simulated from the previous simulation model and input from this model serves as uh, output from the previous simulation model serves as input to the bigger simulation model for the overall line. So there are a total of five parameters to be simulated which corresponds to 288 combination of alternatives. After the simulation was performed, ANOVA was performed to filter out solutions that do not play any impact. It was observed that D, the job scheduling rule, has no significant impact on all the decision criteria, which is all the performance measure. So this solution was removed from the decision making and remaining with 71 combinations. From these remaining 71 combinations, the values of A, B, C, D and E, which were the parameters, were normalized to the obtain an overall score. Based on the overall score, two out of five solutions were selected, which is to enhance printer setup efficiency by implementing QC form as well as improving operator troubleshooting skills. At the end of this stage, the cost of implementation for these actions were uh, designed. Namely, the LOD for QC form, the LOD score of 2, operators can adapt quickly with the changes made in the work elements and for improving troubleshooting skill, the LOD or level of difficulty score of 5, the main concern was human factor. Operators might be unable to meet due to limitation in skill and knowledge. Finally, the contributions of this framework are it successfully uh, promotes remote decision making, quality of solution and practicability of the solutions. This is especially important in the day of uh, as more engineers are uh, opting to work from home attributed to the pandemic. So this is all for my presentation. Thank you. Okay, um, so thank you for this video. I hope you find it uh, interesting as we did last year. Now it's time to move to the first author of this Copperman 2023. This presentation is titled The Impact of Improving the Fast Fashion Business Model on Organization Performance, Case Study Zara Serbia. Um, please, uh, uh, the author should uh, come to the stage. Okay. Hi, Alexandra. I know you asked Hello, us hi. to use uh, a, a recorded audio. You can choose, you can share your presentation and pre present it live, or you can also please open the presentation with the recording audio and use it. Uh, okay. Just choose and share one. Uh, oh. And at the end of it, I will leave you the stage for the question and answer session. Okay, so oh, okay. you choose whether to be online or to use the recording. Okay. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Alexandra Jovicic from the Faculty of Engineering Sciences in Kragujevac and I will be today's presenter of paper, 
the impact of improving the fast fashion business model on organization performance, uh, case study Zara Serbia, as you can see title on, on this uh, slide. Okay, um, uh, the focus um, uh, of uh, this work is uh, pointing out, uh, okay, um, the aim of the paper is uh, to present proposal for improving uh, the fast fashion business model of Zara in Serbia after analyzing the business model of this organization, the Canvas framework. Also, the paper analyzes the impact of these improvements of the performance of the organization. The motive for writing this paper stems from the fact that the detailed analysis and improvement of business models is extremely important for the future operations of the organization. Okay, um, uh, before... Uh, uh, before uh, hey, Alexandra, sorry. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah, we cannot yes. see you. Uh, I mean, we see the title slide. We cannot see you moving from one slide to the next one. We can hear you perfectly, okay. but we cannot see the slide. Okay. We are stuck at the first one, the title slide. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Uh, let's can you can you send? I mean, can you put the screen on the presentation mode? Uh, okay. Uh, so just the second okay yes okay uh, okay yeah here at the bottom you have the cross to the zoom in zoom out uh aha uh -huh. okay bottom. Uh -huh. you can uh, try putting the in the presentation the mode. yes can you can you see can you see now no it's uh, it's the same as before oh so below below on your screen on the bottom part of your screen okay there is okay now i see you moved the slide oh okay okay uh, click on the bottom part of your screen do you see the, the 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 button to zoom in zoom out? Yes, that one. Okay. Move your mouse at the left. No, no. Move it at uh, your left. There's yeah. Click it. So you will be in the presentation mode. Oh, <laughs> I'm I'm so sorry <laughs> for that. Do you, do you have a double screen? Do you have two screen? Two monitors? No. no. Because we still see the the presentation not in the presentation mode. Uh -huh. do, you, do you see uh, differences in your screen when you click that button? No, no, I I don't uh, see difference. Okay, can you go to slideshow in the upper part of your PowerPoint? Okay. You move the mouse on. Okay, slideshow. Slideshow. Okay. Slideshow. Do okay. do you see? Do, do you see? No, because I don't see your. Uh, I can share your slides if you want. Oh, okay. Oh, but let's uh, try like this. I don't. Uh, know do you have a power a PDF? It? A PDF of this presentation? Yes, yes, I have. PDF. Yes, yes, I have. Okay, try with that one. Okay. 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 Oh. Otherwise, you can use it, but not in a presentation mode. Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, can, you can you see that? Uh, not now, but let's wait a minute. 
No. Okay. Uh, take it the presentation back. The PowerPoint will be fine, even if it's not in the in the presentation mode. Okay. Uh, let's move on. I mean, can let's start again. With, can you see? Yes, I can see. I can see. Uh, not in the presentation okay. mode, but it's fine. Don't worry. Uh, go on from where we where you stopped, but please uh, change the mm -hmm. slides because before we were stuck at the title one. And uh, in case of problems, I will come back here on the stage. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. No. Okay. Just a second. Okay. Yeah, you can go. Yeah, yeah, you can go. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, before the starting, uh, it's important to understand uh, what is business uh, model uh, uh, are. Uh, the are num numerous definition of business models, but uh, according to many, we can say the that business model is. Uh, a representation of how the company rates and sell goods and services also earns money and uh, that is aimed at creating the total value for all uh, pa uh, parties involved. That is, the business model describes uh, the way in which the organization creates, uh, delivers and acquires value. Also, the, each company has um, uh, the own business model according to which it uh, operates. Operate okay. Uh, the business model represents a conceptual framework in which the internal and external factor of the company must be taken into account. Uh, numerous framework of business model have been applied. But in this paper, we use the canvas model because it contains detailed element uh, for um, uh, this play. Um, in table uh, show, uh, tab table one, um, okay, uh, and um, the next slide the next is slide. Um, show Alexandra. Us. Excuse me, sorry to okay. interrupt. We don't see you changing the slides. Uh, you can uh, see change? No, I can stay here on the stage because uh, you, you, I can hear you presenting, but I, I'm stuck at the business, business model slide. And I cannot uh -huh. see you. I, I hear that you're clicking the mouse to change the slides, but I don't see you changing it. Oh, again, problem. Problem. Yeah, uh, don't worry. We can do like, like this. Let's let's do like this. I can share the presentation. Okay. Okay. Uh, I okay. can change the slides when you tell me, and you can present it. Okay. Let me let me okay. open it. Okay. Let me open it. Give me one second. Okay. Please give me one second only. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, I will present my uh, the, your presentation on my screen. No, okay. I'm going to do so in a minute. Okay. Give me one second. Okay, present, share the screen, share the presentation, share it. Okay, okay. in a few minutes, you okay. should be able to see your presentation. Okay, I can see. Okay, yeah, you can see. Okay, were you here? Okay. Yes, yes. At this table, right? Okay, yes, yes. yes, it's fine. Okay, I'm going to okay, put the yes, presentation mode. Okay. okay. Do you see it? No. You don't no. see it. Okay. No, I don't see. Let's have, okay. Okay, I will change the slides. You can present it and I will change the slides, okay? Okay, okay. 
Um, table uh, one, uh, as can you see, shows Zara's uh, fast fashion business uh, model with the characteristics of precision, speed, and uh, deceiveness, uh, which explained to the obsolescent clothing lines in the short period of time, which is why people have a physical contention of waiting new product very often. And it is based primarily of the offer fashionable clothes at affordable price with an extremely fast response of the supple chain. That is fast fashion, it characterizes quick product updates, design of accompanying international brands and affordable price. Um, as can you see at the table one, uh, we have um, uh, the K practice, uh, 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 um, cost structure, uh, re research, um, income stream, channels, K research, value proposition, connection, market segment, uh, and uh, K activities. Okay, um, the uh, next slide. Uh, the next slide. Can you yeah. can you move to the next slide? Yeah, yeah. Having a bit of problems. I don't know what type of document it is, but it's not changing. Uh, okay, uh, I'll try to change it. Uh, let me try to do like this. Uh, let me try to do this. try give me one second i guess you have uh, some some problems with the format of the file because it's not uh, changing oh i don't know oh, okay pp let's try with the pdf no no don't worry okay, let me try with the pdf okay uh, okay let me close it Let me stop sharing for a while. Okay. Let's close it. Oh. Can you see the, the slides, the PDF? Yes, uh, I can see. Oh, it's working. Okay. Okay, oh. so you were here, sorry again, but uh, we have to manage problems live. This is the nice part of oh. the live. Uh, so yeah, once again, I will stay here so that if you have problems, I will stay here, okay? Okay. Um, okay. Um, let, uh, the okay uh, in this part of the work uh, we will talk about uh, the results uh, for uh, this um, uh, paper the biggest problem uh, in Serbia is the distribution of Zara's product from one star to another and vice versa where another problem is uh, the existence of goods physical in stores, but not in stock in uh, online sales. Uh, this is a big problem and causes great uh, dissipation among customers who do not uh, live in Belgrade. Uh, however, what characterizes Belgrade are huge traffic jams, uh, so regardless of the small milk from the one Zara store to another, it is necessary to allocate a lot of time for transportation. In the customer does not find the desired article in the certain store, a big of the fatigue nervousness can prevent him from going to another store to buy what he wants. In the end, customers remarked unsatisfied, and on the other hand, Zara is losing loyal customer. Okay, uh, uh, what uh, Zara could introduce uh, in the vehicle uh, that will deliver goods uh, from one of uh, its store to another, which would make it 
it easier for customers, especially those coming from the other parts of Serbia during this time, okay, uh, while the goods are being uh, shipping from one facility to another, the customer could uh, either rest or complete other commitments uh, he had planned. In such an agile approach, the customer remains satisfied, avoiding nervousness and wasting time. The best option would be from the point of view of agility to, to introduce five uh, features uh, to begin uh, with uh, that each facility has one uh, wheel. If, uh, for example, goods uh, were requesting for big fashion from Delta City, then uh, the nurse uh, uh, will call local normally would transport the requesting items. Uh, what uh, Zara could still improve in Serbia is the online purchase of product, which um, is a reflect in the withdrive of goods from stores in the status of online purchase. Given that many products are not in stock when shopping online, while they physically exist in store in Serbia, with up-to-date integration of online and physical offers, sales and customer satisfaction would increase. This is especially important uh, because many customers are the product from more distant place in Serbia. With the mentioned change, uh, incomes would also increase and uh, the, in addition to one search, there would uh, to be a search of income. And finally, what is most important for the po uh, policy and philosophy of Zara, customer would be uh, satisfied. And the next um, slide, uh, uh, you can uh, see the uh, Zara uh, fast fashion model uh, in Canvas framework uh, after the introduction of distribution and improvement uh, of uh, online sales. In uh, table two, uh, increase our market in red and connection are strengthening in blue after the introduction of the mentioned improvement proposal. I can see from the table two with the introduction of the distribution of goods from one star to another and improvement of online shopping, there is also a change in the cost structure. The number of employees would increase, which affect the structure of research, which automa uh, automatically means the allocation of funds to the wage of a new uh, of uh, new employees and possible their training, uh, then it is necessary to install an internal mobile application due to quick uh, response of distribution employees to request from Zara's facilities. Here, of course, are the costs necessary for purchase of a uh, uh, vehicle, which will also represent a key research for distribution with the help of which goods will be transport and full cost. Uh, this income would also increase with the introduction of distribution and improved online shopping and connection uh, would be strengthening. Uh, with uh, the introduction of this proposal, this um, with customer would be even stronger as uh, Zara would once again show loyalty to customer uh, demand and uh, their comfort. Uh, sales in story and online would increase and that uh, Zara income in this country. Okay. And uh, the end, uh, the conclusion of um, is uh, uh, the next uh, slide. Yes. Um, as um, uh, there is no uh, sense fact uh, paper that describes the innovation proposal of the Zara business model in Serbia. This paper can be considered a significant scientific contribution with practical um, application or in this file. This innovative proposal uh, was created based on a review of the literature on the importance of business model, the defined uh, frameworks of business model and the 
current operation of the Zara company. Given the fact that uh, Zara takes special care of customer satisfaction, the proposal given in the paper are special, uh, specially relate to improving the satisfaction of the needs and damage of customer. This is a demonstrated toll improvement in logistic between Zara stories, Belgrade, Serbia, and the improvement in online sales in Serbia in the form of an update connection of the state of good uh, in stores and uh, on a line. And this suggestion for improvement uh, are also shown with the business model canvas where the segment uh, that change after the introduction of uh, the given suggestion are color coded. In this way, with the help of the Canvas business model, it is clear which segment needs special attention and how it will future affect uh, uh, the other elements uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the model. Uh, okay, and um, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Alexandra, for your presentation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have you. had a few problems, but I was uh, no. able to follow you. In, in, I mean, in any case, and I hope also the audience could follow the work. Um, um, I ask if there yeah. are questions or curiosities on this work coming by the audience. Uh, otherwise, I have a few questions. Okay. Um, are there comments? In the meantime, I think I will go with my questions. Uh, I have many, but I will focus on uh, uh, some of them. Uh, what was the process adopted by the authors to check if the changes in the business model produced positive impacts on the performance of Zara Serbia? So, I mean, you showed us that by following the canvas and by adopting changes, then the performance of Zara Serbia improved. How, what was the process that she adopted to, to check if oh. the changes made impacted in a positive way the Zara performance? Uh, okay, uh, uh, Zara's performance, uh, okay, uh, the... Uh, Zara uh, have uh, this uh, proposal uh, 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 flexibility, uh, uh, agility in Serbia, because uh, uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm. Yeah, don't um, worry. Don't worry. I mean, uh, it's just. Uh, uh, did you, I mean, did you went there and measure the performance to see before and after the changes made? Oh, uh, before and, uh, okay, uh, before, uh, perfor uh, performance for the company, Zara, uh, okay, uh, the, Okay, yeah, don't worry, yeah, don't yeah, worry. Yeah. And I, I was wondering uh, some things about this work. I see that this is uh, about Zara Serbia, right? I guess it's because yeah. uh, maybe it's around your geographical place, right? Yes, but, yes. Uh, you know that Zara has many shops all around the world. Yes. So right. I was also wondering uh, if this methodology that you adopted and this work that you did could also be repeated in other Zara shops. Oh no. Can it be done? Can it be made? Uh, no, just in Serbia. In... Okay, okay, okay. Okay. And last question comes from the audience. It's by Italo Fantozzi. What are some potential you can also read it. Uh, I, I read it, but you can also have the writings. What are uh, uh, some uh. potential challenges and risks? What are those risks that may face implementing the improvements to its business model in Serbia, such as expanding its distribution network and investing in online sales? Uh, okay. I'll try to reformulate. I mean, uh, if, uh, for example, Zara, expands its distribution network or maybe uh, 
open an online uh, channel like e-commerce, uh, okay. what potential challenges and risks they face when implementing the changes and the improvements that you suggested? Uh, the model in Can you read the question? Uh, okay. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, Is it possible that Zara Serbia opens uh, a channel online? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, it's possible. But uh, does it does it affect does it impact the study that you did if they do so? Uh, excuse me. Uh, can you can you repeat that? Yeah. If they, uh, I mean, no. uh, we said that it's possible that Zara Serbia has an, an online channel, for example. Okay. Okay. If okay. this is possible, opening an online channel will affect and impact the study that you develop? Uh, yes. 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 Okay. okay. I agree okay. with you. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. 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 Alexandra, I see you also have another study uh, coming oh, up yes. for this one. So we can well switch to that one. Um, I think it's better if we share the PDF as in this case. Okay. Uh, if you agree. And again, Agreed. as, as uh, before, uh, we can we can change the slides, and you can comment on that. Is it okay, okay for you? Okay, okay, okay. So okay. let's go to the next presentation of today. Uh, uh, Alessandra Jojic will share it. Will present it. The title is "The Impact of Solving Barriers to the Implementation of Quality 4.0 on the Performance of the Organization's Operations." <laughs> Yes. So, Alexandra, uh, as said, we, sh we will share the PDF. I will leave you the stage as the presenter. You will have the next 15 minutes to discuss the work. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, just the, 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 the second. Okay, uh, introduction. Uh, the, uh, the focus um, of the, this work uh, is on pointing out the barriers and proposing a solution for solving them in the case of quality 4.0 with the aim of overcoming the problems of introduction uh, quality 4.0, which have a particularly high impact on improving the overall performance of the organization. Um, uh, the motive of writing the paper lies in the fact uh, that there is no literature in which the mentioned concept uh, is unified. Um, uh, okay, uh, be before starting the results, uh, um, it's important to understand what uh, quality 4.0 is, and um, this is the next uh, slide. Uh, okay. Uh, what is quality 4.0 is. Um, consulting the new topic, there is no generally accepted definition of quality, so numerous authors define the concept of quality 4.0 in various ways. 
uh, but uh, by um, uh, combining numerous definition of quality 4.0 we can be defined uh, um, quality 4.0 as the digitalization of and the expansion of traditional quality management activities and the transformation of managerial thinking and the uh, acquisition of new employee skills with the aim of more efficient and productive management of the entry value chain in the organization. Okay. Uh, now, the term uh, quality 4.0 is defined not only in terms of product uh, service specification, but also flexibility, agility, responsiveness, uh, and after sales activities. In other order, for organization to take full advantage of quality 4.0, it is necessary to understand the barriers that arise, which are emergent uh, by using the synergy of well-known quality tools and principles and uh, quality 4.0 uh, uh, tools. Um, uh, the, Second, uh, the, the, the uh, next slide uh, is uh, uh, we can talk uh, about the results of uh, this um, uh, paper. And um, uh, in paper also, just the uh, uh, paper. Uh, based on a review of the literature table one uh, uh, shows seven possible barriers to the introduction of quality 4.0 in organization with the presentation of possible solution to these barriers and the impact of those solution of the organization performance with the aim of the simple and more uh, con uh, confessively uh, review of the this uh, asher um and in next slide um uh, you you can uh, see the table uh, with overview of barriers and possible solution for the introduction of quality 4.0 with uh, an impact of organization uh, performance um, for um, uh, the first barriers um, uh, uh, just the second I, I can uh, for the uh, for, for the first barriers absence of the defined a new digital strategy and plan uh, uh, we have six possible solutions where place uh, as can you see in the, the table and those are defined in a the digital strategy vision for the adoption of a quality 4.0 philosophy and a lignic quality objective around those strategies um, uh, uh understanding the impact of uh, new technologies of organization performance understanding the new paradigm of quality 4.0 and the requirements of industry 4.0 introduction of te tech OM and so on for um, uh, this um, barrier solution we get the following performance impact uh, i can you see um, uh, and uh, this uh, slide uh, uh, great strategy agility defining uh, defining k performance indicator low cost um, uh, clear strategy uh, strat strategy and and so on the second uh, barriers is um, the initial cost uh, uh, next slide and the next slide uh, we, we uh, okay, you can see uh, the second barriers uh, the initial cost of implementing quality 4.0 is high lack of research and um, there is um, the possible solution for that barriers um, such as evaluation of long time return of asset uh, with financial and non financial metric, understanding and knowing the best way to invest in the implement advice in digital tools, um, 
integration of ERP system and lean philosophy as a basic for industry 4.0 uh, and, and, and horizontal and vertical integration and, and so on. And, uh, the imp uh, per performance impact um, uh, with um, barrier uh, for barrier solution is less waste, carp, stock, reducing failure, better technology, improving quality performance, security, risk, uh, uh, improving operating incoming, um, uh, and, and so on, as can you see uh, in this uh, slide. Uh, the next slide, uh, uh, we have... Uh, uh, next barriers and uh, this is a uh, data ownership uh, and uh, data security and uh, for these barriers we have uh, next solution proper selection application of modern industry 4.0 technology cloud platforms ai engineering data networks knowledge of quality 4.0 technologies uh, training for employees to time detect and agility react to cyber attack implementation of ISO uh, 27001 standard uh, and uh, so on. Impact of uh, performance for, uh, for this uh, uh, solution of barriers is uh, real-time data collection, uh, uh, more competitive in the global market, continuous improvement, the cost of damage to data loss or damage low, better security of the information system and red, uh, reduction of costs related to damage that occur if the standard is not applied and proper and agile communication between uh, all in Greece parts uh, using industry 4.0 technology. Uh, in next slide, uh, we have uh, the next uh, barriers, <coughs> okay, uh, and this uh, is a, a lack of knowledge and vision about uh, the implementation of quality 4.0, and uh, they they are have um, uh, the next uh, solution for this uh, barrier standardized framework for implementation uh, quality 4.0 horizontal integration um, uh, determination of key performance indicators special uh, experts in the field of the digital tech UM, and um, uh, we uh, get for this barrier solution uh, um, next performance impact uh, uh, there are reducting of errors and a complication in organization with continuous monitoring of quality throughout uh, kpa reducting the cost of poor quality the uh, fifth barrier is a uh, lack of digital quality skills and um, uh, we uh, have uh, uh, improve for these uh, barriers uh, improvement of basic skills and level of skills employing training and uh, a clear strategy uh, impact of um, performance uh, is uh, efficiently solving new characteristic problem in accordance with new change the sixth barrier is absence of the uh, uh, subly organization could culture and um, we uh, have uh, uh, for solution uh, building acute quality creating quality uh, teams uh, focusing on three aspect people process and technology using the tool of the lean philosophy and so on uh, as you can see in this slide uh, the performance impact for this uh, uh, solution of barriers uh, we have employee satisfaction and a better and safer position of the organization of the market and uh, the next slide we have um, uh, um, uh, the competitive advantage uh, is not clear barriers Okay, uh, the solution for these uh, barriers is uh, finding the right way to share competitive advantages, uh, cre uh, 
uh, creation of teams from different sectors and understanding horizontal and vertical quality and integration 4.0. The impact of performance for uh, these barriers is um, in increased competitiveness and customer uh, reta uh, retention. Um, for each individual barrier from the table one, uh, uh, a proposal is given for several possible solutions which future affect the performance of the organization. Individual proposed solution to one barriers can be used to solve other barriers, while the effect of those solutions on the present performance of the organization can be repeated on another consequence of the solution. However, given that the authors try not to repeat solution and performance in the table solution and impact of performance that are most relevant to a practical barriers are shown. As the first and case segment of solving all present barriers can be mentioned, defining strategy and quality 4.0 introduction plans, understanding horizontal and vertical integration understanding and pre uh, prepare selection and integration of industry 4.0 technology. And, uh, and uh, the next slide, uh, we have a conclusion. Uh, okay, and um, we, we can uh, say also the uh, paper uh, present a literature review of barriers related to quality 4.0 and present a tabular presentation of seven universal barriers to the introduction of quality 4.0 with proposed possible solution and the impact of the solution or present barriers of this performance on the organization in order to better understand the introduction of quality 4.0 in organization. All, uh, the, uh, the paper also presents solution for overcoming barriers and special attention is paid to the impact on organization performance. And uh, uh, that's it. Uh, and thank you very much for that, for our attention. Okay, thank you, Alessandra, for this uh, second presentation. I uh, wait a minute to see if some questions arrive uh, uh, here. I don't see them yet, but I wait just one second. Um, questions from the audience? No. Okay. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for both presentations. They have been very, very interesting. I see we are also perfectly on time for the next uh, author to present. So it's time to move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, I ask the author to come to the stage. Okay. Good morning, Salima. Uh, Hello. The next presentation of Copper Copperman 2023 is titled The Impact of Venture Capital on Corporate Social Performance. Yes. So, Salima, I leave the stage to you. You will have 15 minutes to discuss your work, after which there will be a Q&A session, okay? Okay, okay. I'm just trying to... Um, yeah. To share. So, I have to share my screen, right? Or do I have to, sh yes. to share? Yes, yes. You can share mm -hmm. your screen with your presentation. Okay. Let me try... Not sure. Yeah, yeah, I tell you when I see something. Yeah, I have issues. I, I is it possible the, to the, share it from your end? What? Yes, I can. Okay. Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Let me share the screen. Share it. Hmm. So uh, now... okay. I think it's working now. Let's see. Is it working? 
Can you see my uh, screen? Do you, do you see my screen? Do you see my screen? I don't. Uh, I'm okay. Let me see. Let me, give me one minute. This is your screen. I see your okay. screen. Okay. Okay. Can you see the presentation on my screen? Not yet. Okay. Okay. So I'll let you do it then. I'll let you do it. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so now you should see the presentation on my screen, right? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Okay, let me check if it works. Yes, it worked. Okay, so you okay. can start and ask me when to change. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Alessandra. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share um, my findings and my paper um, work. So, uh, the, the, so the purpose of my paper is to study the impact of venture capital on corporate social performance. My name is Salima Alani. I am from Group ISCAE in Casablanca, Morocco. Next slide, please. Uh, so first, a uh, little uh, uh, presentation of the plan. So um, we're going to present uh, in the introduction the, the context and the interest for the subjects and then present the main concepts in our uh, research, uh, um, show you the, our met the methodology used and the proposed framework before uh, uh, the, proposing the results and our conclusion. Next slide, please. So first, a definition of the concept. Um, venture capital uh, provides capital to companies that might uh, have difficulty attracting financing. The companies are typically small and young, facing high level of uncertainty. VC firms finance these high risk and potentially highly rewarding projects by purchasing shares or equity stakes. So the venture capital investment is structured around four segments aligned with the company's life cycle. The creation of young companies is supported by early stage venture capital. Growth capital supports the expansion of young enterprises. And the turnaround capital gives a second chance to struggling companies. The investment cycle begins with raising venture capital funds, followed by investing in companies and monitoring a value creation. It continues as the venture capital firm exits returning capital to its investors and repeats again as the investor raises additional funds. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the literature on venture capital, it uh, identifies a significant role for uh, VC investors that extends beyond providing capital as they are uh, actively involved in the management of the firms they finance. Uh, they are involved in the strategy of the firm, the investment decisions, and provide valuable advisory services to the founders. They also play a role in human resource management and recruitment. So with re recent ma major changes in economy and the environment, social responsibility and social impact are becoming increasingly important factors in uh, investor decision making. I, I'm showing you like a screenshot of um, uh, um, uh, the website of a uh, um, investment venture capital investment firm called Medita Mediterranean Capital Partners. It's, it's one of the major um, VC firm in the uh, MENA region, North Africa region. And uh, so we have this message. Uh, it says we invest in consolidated and growing companies with a focus on value creation and sustainable development. So the message is uh, that uh, uh, beyond financial contribution, the investors are really interested in a value creation in the firms they are invested in, investing in. So uh, we are interested to know how will the investor activism impact the performance of a uh, financed company and more specifically, their social performance. Next slide, please. So, um, so literature, the literature on venture capital has largely focused on finan financial impact, while there is little research on how venture capital influences the social responsibility of uh, financed companies. So the purpose of this paper is to provide a review of existing literature on the subject and propose a hypothesis and a conceptual framework to explain this relationship. Next slide, please. To do that, it is important to understand the concept of corporate social performance. 
So uh, corporate social performance is described in the literature as a concept that covers all aspects of social responsibility. The literature suggests that the evolution in termino terminology from different corporate social responsibility approaches to the concept of social performance aims to create measures in order to validate a uh, company's social actions. Uh, Bowen, in 1953, provide the first definition of corporate social responsibility, uh, suggesting that it represents a commitment by the company to serve both society and the stakeholders that goes beyond legal and economic obligations. This is therefore a voluntary initiative uh, to address the, dif uh, the demands of different uh, stakeholders from the company. And the concept of corporate social performance extends beyond mere responsibility and covers the strategies that the companies put into actions and, and the specific areas where these initiatives are implemented. So according to the literature, Wood, uh, Wood's model remains the most effective definition of corporate social performance by suggesting three levels of analysis on the individual level, organization level, and, um, uh, and institutional level. And all of this taking into account the different stakeholders and society. So in order to, to understand the concept of corporate social performance, the main question is how well a company fulfills its social commitments and achieves outcomes that demonstrate its social motivation. Next slide, please. The literature provides multiple tools for assessing social performance. We have compiled a literature review covering uh, 317 studies published between 1971 and 2022. Our review is based on articles published on prominent peer-reviewed international journals and includes uh, four meta-analyses. Uh, our uh, analysis of the literature has enabled us to highlight a wide range of approaches for, um, for measuring the corporate social performance and identify important methodological uh, ambiguities in, the, in this measure. Early methods for measuring uh, corporate social performance used scoring indicators such as pol pollution, reputation, or corporate philanthropy indicators. However, these approaches were subject to criticism for their limited scope and failure to provide a comprehensive assessment. So more inclusive methods uh, involved using, uh, survey, uh, using um, uh, annual reports or the Fortune magazine's corporate reputation survey. And uh, uh, later on, some uh, uh, private agencies developed rating processes for corporate social performance measurements, like the KLD index. So the KLD index emerged in the literature as the most widely used resource for this purpose. Uh, subsequently, questionnaire surveys have also been developed to create percep perceptual uh, measures of corporate social performance. Next slide, please. Uh, the literature um, extensively highlights the positive impact of uh, venture capital on financial performance and the uh, investor involvement uh, in portfolio companies is associated with higher financial profitability. But what about social performance? Next, please. Uh, so on the one hand, the supporters of the stake stakeholder theory defend a largely positive relationship through investors' activism in the company's governance, strategy, and investment decision. Next, please. Whereas uh, the, classical, the classical theory suggests a negative impact if investors seek financial profitability rather than social value. Next, please. At this stage, the literature leans more towards a positive impact of venture capital on social performance through the influence of social practices. Next, please. So uh, the next step in our research is to conduct in an empirical uh, exploration and validation through existing data. First, we propose a framework and a hypothesis in order uh, to study the impact of venture capital uh, investors on corporate social performance, either directly or through the mediating role of their involvement. 
uh, in the firm's management. We are also interested in exploring how the socio-demographic characteristics of VC firms can moderate the relationship between venture capital and corporate social performance through the size of the fund or the type of investors, if they are private or public investors. Next slide, please. So uh, our literature uh, has identified a significant role uh, for venture capital uh, through the involvement of the investors in firms' governance, strategy, and investment decisions. And it has also highlighted uh, uh, multiple approaches for measuring corporate social performance. So based on, on our um, literature review, we have um, developed a conceptual model and research hypothesis to explore the factors driving this relationship. At this point, uh, an empirical study involving VC-funded companies could be valuable to further enrich the study and provide more detailed analysis on the uh, so social, economic, and managerial implications of venture capital investments. Next slide, please. So that's some references uh, used on the bibliography. And uh, thank you very much for your, for your attention. OK, thank you very much, Salim. I try to uh, fit in the time. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I mean, uh, it's OK if uh, I shared the slides. I, I was checking and everything was uh, perfectly. I could hear you perfectly. I could see the slide. I hope also the audience uh, could do so. Uh, so in the meantime, I ask if uh, somebody from the listeners have questions. I don't see comments coming, but I wait for them. Uh, otherwise, I have some, some questions. Uh, it seems uh, in the meantime, when, while I wait, I give one minute to the listeners to eventually uh, send some questions. Uh, uh, I thank you for this uh, presentation because I see that you used a lot of uh, lot of different uh, uh, methodologies. It's a deep literature review. It's empirical investigation. So my first question is: Have you considered any other machine learning algorithm, for example, or any other methodology to be adopted in your uh, study uh, along with those uh, that you already used? Uh, regarding the re regarding the me measure of corporate social performance, or uh... what? Sorry, uh, I I'm not sure I understand uh, the question. Uh, the question is: you, I, I see you used a lot of different methodologies. Okay, I see you had a very, I mean, a deep literature review, some empirical investigation. You adopted many different KPIs, so it's very interesting. Are you considering introducing other KPIs or other methodologies along with this to extend your work in the future, or uh, it will be stuff like this? No, actually, yes. I uh, I've been uh, we reviewed all uh, the 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 metrics, but actually, because the because we are on the, um, the research is based in Morocco, so I'm focused on the Moroccan market. So the venture capital market in Morocco is not that big. Um, so it's hard. We don't have access. For example, the KLD measure doesn't cover uh, companies in Morocco. It's more like uh, Europe and uh, 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 America and um, some big, uh, big are you, market. Are you, consider, are you considering extending your study to other places rather than in Morocco? No, I'm focused on Morocco. I'm focused on Morocco. Okay. And so we have decided to, to focus more on the survey, on the questionnaire survey using the letter the literature and using like items that have been dev that have been um, developed in the literature and uh, and approved by the literature to give us more uh, to give us more uh, confidence in our research okay 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 thank you very much salima uh, thank you for your presentation uh, thank you for being the, here. I think we can switch to the next uh, presenter. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you too. Okay, next presenter uh, can come on stage. Good morning, okay. I guess. Uh, uh, good morning. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, I can share my slides, us. right? Yeah, you will present us a, a paper titled Exploring the Use of Questionnaires as a Tool to Assess the Human Robot Collaboration. So I leave you the stage. Uh, yes, you sure. will have the next 15 minutes to present your work. Thank you. Yes, for sure. Just give me. I think we have some connection problems. He disconnected. Let's wait for a while. Uh, okay. Now I'm uh, going good to... Good morning, Edmund. I see you're back on stage. Yes. Uh, maybe you had some connection problems. Let's uh, try can to you see... present. Yeah, no, I don't see your screen, but I see you. Oh, wait, uh, I, will, I will show you my screen. Just a moment. Yes. Okay. Can you do so? Yes. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, it's arriving. Uh, give me okay, one. Okay, thank I you. can see your screen. Yes. But not okay, your presentation. You. Can you see my presentation? Because I. No, I see my... your internet connection. Are you are you sharing the screen oh or the presentation? I'm sharing the screen. Okay, try to share the presentation. So stop sharing. Okay. And try again, but when uh, clicking on share, share the slides, not the screen. Okay. Try, let's try like this. Okay. Just give me a moment. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. Otherwise, we can try to share your slides. It's sharing, I think. Okay, it's processing. A second. Mm -hmm. Is it working? Yeah, it's processing. Oh, okay. Okay. Can you see? Can you see my slides? Yeah, it's right? the loading. Okay, yes, okay. we perfectly see. Okay, okay so, so the stage is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, hello, everyone. It's Adnan Vakas, uh, and I'm presenting University of Campania. Uh, the topic uh, of my presentation today is exploring the use of a questionnaire as a tool to access the human robot collaboration. First, I will try to explain my topic that what uh, I'm gonna explain in this presentation. So uh, we have uh, collected uh, a literature review using uh, human robot collaboration or interactions. So in this, we find a lot of literature and from those literature, we find some questionnaire which could help us to analyze human robot collaboration that how uh, in uh, same workspace, a human and a robot work together that um, what the feelings and uh, what the feelings of the human for the robot if they are working in the same workspace for example if somebody if a human in, in a manufacturing industry uh, a human and a robot are working um, in the same workspace so a human a human worker can have some safety issues some trust issues some satisfaction some comfort this kind of issues he can face because um, uh, in real robot is a machine so machine is um, like algorithm algorithm by the human so it could have some trouble so in the start in the start it could have some 
discomfort, some distrust, but um, uh, by using our questionnaire as a tool, we are going to assess that how human and robot are collaborating or interacting in our um, manufacturing industry. So uh, I will start my slides. So first of all, my research goal and uh, the agenda, it shows the scope of the work. What is the scope of the work here? Let me explain like, um, in our research, we are going to propose some uh, systematic literature review. Uh, as I mentioned all uh, before that we have uh, collected a literature review uh, for human robot interaction. So from that literature review, we collected the questionnaires which the authors have uh, used in their articles. Some authors have used um, customized questionnaires. Some authors used non-customized questionnaires. So by these kind of questionnaires, we are going to assess uh, how questionnaire measures the impact of robots on human, like um, how the humans are feeling when they are working together in a human robot interaction environment. So the topic review um, uh, is that like, um, uh, HRI, human robot interaction, is a base for future production system. Right now, in the uh, production industry, of, we are also using um, human and robot interaction. We are also facing like the robots are working at the same time with the humans. <coughs> Sorry. So, um, in the future, it's going to be more and more. So, we are going to, uh, we, we use this as a base to. Uh, 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 start our research to assess uh, by using the questionnaire. So what methodology we are using? Uh, we are using the methodology of the literature review. Uh, we uh, got um, uh, literature from different authors who worked on the human-robot interaction, and um, we screened those uh, according to our demand, according to our um, key points that which we are going to perform in our research. So we have used this methodology from the literature review uh, of different authors who worked in this area of human, uh, uh, human robot interaction. Uh, and uh, use and we used a different kind of and they use different kind of questionnaires and we assess those questionnaires those questionnaires depends like they are for example they um some questionnaires are the type uh, like telling the type of the scale they are using some questionnaires telling the number of uh, type of questions they are using and then at the end we analyze the results from those questionnaires and um, in the presentation, in the results part, I'm going to present some uh, graphs uh, uh, by using uh, the type of scale, the type of experiments, the type of questions which we are using. So in the, in the results part, I'm going to show you the results in the pictorial forms. So uh, our problem review is like this research actually uh, proposes an empirical investigation for evaluating the sustainability of different degrees of human robot interaction so what is different degrees degrees of human robot interaction what is that so uh, different degrees of human robot interaction is like how a human is interacting with a robot it is uh, they are just uh, sharing a workspace, workspace, or they are contacting with each other, or they have the same goal. What kind of um, uh, like interaction they have between each other? And the other thing, like uh, in the um, uh, human robot interaction, what is the contribution of human robot interaction? So human robot interaction could have two uh, in two sides. One is positive and one is negative. In the positive sides, we can say that um, it could be safe, it could be uh, physically safe, or it could have some trust or comfort. Or, or and in the negative sides, uh, the interaction could be cause some mental stress, some anxiety, um, this kind. Of uh, things in the negative uh, impacts of the HRI contribution. So uh, these uh, diagrams can show the human um, and uh, robot uh, um, interaction like in the manufacturing industry or some experiments in the other uh, diagram. It shows like it's some general experiments which has been performed 
which has been performed um, uh, to study. So um, next, uh, the, uh, like uh, the international standards, international standards of um, ISO has uh, um, regulate the safety requirements. As I mentioned, those are three interactions between human and robot. One is coexistence, another is cooperation, and the uh, third one is collaboration. In the coexistence, um, human and robot are working on the same space, but their tasks are different. The second one is cooperation. In the cooperation stage, the human and work uh, and robot are also working in the same workspace and they have the same task, they have the same aim, they have the same purpose. And in the third stage, collaboration. In the, in the collaboration stage, they, are, they both are working in the same workspace, they have the same task and they are even have a contact with each other. To explain more about uh, these three points, uh, I'm gonna show you another picture. In this picture, you can see like um, in coexistence, they are sharing the working time and the workspace. In the corporation, they are showing working time, workplace, uh, workplace and aim, what is their purpose? And in the collaboration, working time, workplace, aim, and even the contact. So, Research question, what could be our research question? As, as I mentioned before that uh, when human and robot are interacting with each other, so human could have some um, uh, analyzed features. Human can analyze some uh, key factors while interacting with a robot. That could be that could be trust, that could be comfort, that could be social uh, exclusion, that could be uh, satisfaction, a lot of factors. So we are going to talk about these features by using the questionnaire. So what methodology we have adopted? So um, we use the platform of Scopus and uh, we selected by, uh, uh, by using human robot interaction, we selected, uh, we find 193 articles. Here we, uh, you can see IC1, IC2, IC3. These are the uh, screening criteria so in IC1, we have um, limit the number of years. So we have limit the number of years from 2010 to 2023. In IC2 and IC3, we have uh, screened those papers who are written in English and those are generals and conferences papers. So we have screened 153 articles in IC2 and IC3. And in the first screening, uh, we see like uh, the topic we just read the topics and we screened like in this we have screened 103 articles and in the second screening we reading it's the abstract reading and from that screening we we moved to 27 articles and in the final screening it was the full paper screening in the full paper screening we choose we screened 16 articles and from those 16 articles we use the questionnaires and we assess how these questionnaires impacts on human um, uh, uh, robots on humans in the human robot in, uh, interaction environment. So um, uh, while I'm going moving towards my results, so results <coughs> showing type of scale, uh, frequency of human analyzed key factors, type of questions, type of robot, type of environment, and type of experiment. So I'm gonna show you all the results related all these points. So my first uh, graph uh, about frequency of human analyzed key factors. In the horizontal side, it shows the key factors which are analyzed by humans, which could be safety, which could be comfort and satisfaction, which could be naturalness, how they are working. Is it natural or um, it feels not natural? Uh, and the acceptance, uh, how the human is accepting the robot movements and um, uh, anthropomorphism, like uh, is it looks like a human, like human humanite robot, or um, like these factors which we, uh, the human analyzed during working in, with a robot in a human robot interaction. So you can see in this graph the safety factor, the safety factor is used the most in the papers. Like we selected 16 articles and uh, in 11 articles, uh, the questionnaire uh, of safety has been used. So, uh, and the second is comfort and satisfaction. So for sure, like if we are talking about 
uh, a human and a robot collaboration. So uh, how human is uh, feeling uh, comfortable or he is feeling satisfaction by working with a robot. So these factors are the highest and the minimum is like um, the acceptance of uh, robot movements and sense of control, these kind of things. So in this graph shows um, you know, the uh, human analyzed key factors, like how frequently these kind of questions are used in these articles, which we have screened in our research. The next slide shows the type of robot and the environment. You can see here in the, the type of environment, we have two kinds of environments. One is physical and one is virtual, which is created by humans. <laughs> the physical environment is 69%. So it shows that uh, the most uh, experiments and the most work is done uh, in the physical environment, like in the manufacturing industry, in production industry. And you can see the other graph, it's type of robot. So type of robot, uh, we have three different uh, kinds of robots in our uh, literature, which uh, we studied. Uh, these are physical humanoid robot, physical industrial robots, and virtual industrial robots. So we have three uh, different kinds of uh, robots, which we have studied uh, in this literature. So um, if you can see here, the 69% is the physical. And here we have two physical robots. One is physical humanoid and one is industrial, physical industrial manipulator. So it's covering 38% and 31%. Like it means like 69%, which is physical part from the environment is sharing these robots. And 31%, which is the virtual is sharing the virtual robots. The type of experiments uh, performed, we uh, in, in our literature, we have uh, find out that um, three different kinds of experiments has been performed. One is order picking. In order picking, um, the robot is helping uh, or collaborating the human to pick uh, some objects and um, give it to human or place somewhere or store somewhere. So this is uh, a simple order picking and uh, in the trust part in the trust part uh, i just explained before it's not that trust the trust kind of experiments are those experiments like for example uh, if a human and a robot uh, a human is playing a game for example a cards game right so a robot will be uh, there as an advisor of human um, so the robot can help the human with their uh, gestures with the so how human how much human should trust the robot instructions or not it is that kind of trust so uh, this kind of experiments and the general experiments uh, okay so the next analysis uh, analysis is about the human key factors and the number of questions so like the number of how many number of questions um, has been used related to the uh, human key factors analyzed so you can see here the comfort and satisfaction has the most number of questions in this uh, research and then you can see uh, the trust part and then anxiety and stress because in the start of um, any collaboration between human and robot uh, a human could have some anxiety that the robot will work properly the robot um, uh, the environment which the workspace which they are sharing will be well operated and uh, it, the human could have anxiety and stress. So this graph shows that how many numbers, uh, number of questions related to the uh, key factors has been used. So you can see the, uh, the most number of questions are comfort and uh, satisfaction. So the next is the results related to the number of questions and the number of articles in each article, how many questions have been used. So uh, you can see here, like um, uh, so some papers used five questions, some papers used seven questions, some papers used 14 questions. So from each, uh, like every author uh, tried to um, build a questionnaire, uh, which could be uh, possibly related to the human uh, analyzed key factors. And uh, the next part is our conclusion. In the conclusion, uh, the first is validity of questionnaire. What does it mean by validity? That the questionnaire which we are using can be valid and reliable for assessing the quality of human-robot collaboration. 
The next is multidimensional evaluation. In the multidimensional evaluation, um, it is like uh, the questionnaire assessed in the study successfully captures multiple dimensions of the human robot interaction, such as communication, trust, task performance, and overall satisfaction. Next is benchmarking and comparison, and the other and the last one is continuous assessment. Future research. <clears throat> Our future research is in the field of human robot interaction, including the development of more specialized questionnaires. Like um, uh, in this research, uh, we have uh, find questionnaires from the authors. We can more we can uh, make it more specialized to assess uh, the uh, to explore the cultural and contextual differences as well and investigating the correlation between uh, uh, questionnaire responses and objective performance matrices. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. If you have any questions, please. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Uh, I ask if there are questions. I see two of them already arrived by Leonardo Leoni, but uh, any other question would be very welcome. So if you have just type them as a comment on LinkedIn and YouTube and I will read. Okay, uh, you received two questions. The first one is, uh, during the presentation, we saw the main factors assessed by the questionnaires. What about naturalness? What does it represent? Uh, naturalness. Naturalness is yeah. like the, because, um, uh, because the robot uh, are different kind of robots uh, we have seen in, in this research in this literature one is uh, uh, physical industrial robot physical industrial robots have could could have one arm could have two arms so it doesn't look like uh, a human or how it works is it looks natural like is it looks the work of humans like how humans are working uh, or if we are using a home uh, humanoid robot. So humanoid robot uh, ex, uh, gives more naturalness in the environment, but the efficiency of humanoid robot is not much. Uh, humanoid robot is not much efficient in the industry, um, like the industrial manipulator robot. So here we are using, um, in this uh, aspect, we are using naturalness. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, the other question is, uh, when you showed the type of experiments performed, what do you mean for general? Okay, uh, yeah, I showed uh, three kinds of experiments. One was order picking, one was general, and one was trust. So in general, um, uh, the, the type of experiments could be like, um, the robot is helping to paint, to tightening the screw. This kind of experiments could be general experiments. For example, the robot is helping in uh, kind of uh, work like welding, like uh, in, the, in the production industry, there is a fabrication um, uh, department in the fabrication department, they do some welding. So robot could help in welding because nowadays in the aerospace industry, the, uh, the most um, precise welding is used. So robots help humans to uh, use that, uh, to do that work of welding and even painting in the aerospace industry and even in the automobile industry. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your interesting presentation and for these answers. Um, thank you. I think we can move to the next uh, presenter. Yeah. Thank, we, you so uh, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's move to the next presenter. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Sergio. Uh, you good morning, Alessandra. As a, yeah, you will present as a paper titled Why and How Responsible Organizations Are Assessing Their Performance, State of the Practice in Ethical, Social and Environmental Accounting. Uh, I leave you the stage as a presenter. You will have 15 minutes available starting from now. Um, I suggest you sharing the slides, not the end. Okay, I see. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Can you also hear me well? Yes. Okay, perfect. 
Okay, I'll proceed. Well, thank you very much. The title of the paper is Why and How Responsible Organizations Are Assessing Their Performance, The State of the Practice in Environmental, Social and Governance Accounting. My name is Sergio, and this work has been produced in collaboration with Vijanti, Sara, Gudrun, Julie, and Oscar, either from Utrecht University or Universidad Politeca de Valencia. Um, so the agenda is going to be very simple. I'll introduce the topic and provide some background information. I'll clarify the resource method, and then I will move on to, sorry, um, describing the main results and some discussion uh, related to the conclusions. Okay. So a responsible organization, to set some focus, is an organization that performs according to ethical values, taking care of their impact on society and on the environment, beyond its legal obligations, something that we've heard before in another presentation. Among these logos, you probably recognize some famous social enterprises. There are limited societies, cooperatives, foundations, NGOs, so there's different formats, and they also differ in sizes. Yeah? Often they are grouped in networks. For instance, you might also recognize international networks here, such as big corporations or the economy for the common good. Um, there's also national networks such as MBO Netherlands, socialenterprise.nl from uh, the Netherlands, or REAS, which is from Spain, which is the network of networks of alternative and solidarity economy. Some networks are also sometimes sectorial, such as the Fair Trade Software Foundation, which is focused on ICT and software development. Well, these organizations have in common that they care about environmental, social, and governance topics, ESG in short, which is phenomena that these organizations or individuals sometimes care or are concerned about and therefore they want to measure the performance. These organizations typically not only care about the bottom line or economic performance, but also about a range of other topics, such as gender equity or gas emissions. Of course, this is not a comprehensive list eh, or comprehensive taxonomy. There's, uh, depending on the method or on the standards and the frameworks, there's different lists. But to assess the performance on these topics, organizations typically resort to environmental, social, and governance accounting, which receives many names, as I will, as I will mention. ESGA will be the acronym that I will use. It's the process of assessing the social and environmental effects of an organization's actions and reporting them to particular interest groups, such as stockholders or owners, or to society at large. This is known, for instance, also as sustainability reporting, because in fact, it's one of the main outputs of this accounting. It's also known as CSR reporting, integrated reporting, uh, sustainability disclosures. There's many different names. OK, but how is this done? Well, sometimes accounting is done in-house by CSR managers, sustainability officers. We refer to this in a generic term as ESGA practitioners. Sometimes the organization hires the services of ESGA consultants who are providing advice or performing the accounting for them. And we refer to the process that they need to carry out as the ESGA method. And in essence, they assess the performance of the organization on a given ESG topic or several by gathering a structural and operational data and by calculating or estimating key performance indicators. This data conforms what we call the ESG account. Our research method more or less was the following. It's always more winding road than it seems, but this is a good, uh, accurate uh, representation. We have done a multivocal literature review, which means that it's a systematic structural review, etc. But at some point, uh, we accept gray literature because there was a lot of information coming from uh, industry, industry uh, regulators, uh, sometimes international institutions such as the United Nations, etc. It has proven a nice approach because we have found so far 90 methods, which is a considerable number. I will mention more about this later. And we have also deployed a survey for ESGA practitioners and consultants receiving 73 responses so far, uh, 54 from practitioners, the rest from consultants. And finally, for a sample of 33 of these methods, we have analyzed the documentation very deeply. In some cases, we have got training on the methods, we have talked to experts, we have followed tutorials or uh, even in some in some cases certification programs. And for these 33 methods, we have defined some models using a method engineering notation called process deliverable diagram that I will show later as an example. And 19 of these models have been validated by experts. So some interesting results are the following. So uh, first, uh, we asked them uh, about the motivations, why their organization would like to do such an accountancy, which takes time and money. And the survey I found most interesting, uh, the result that I found most interesting was that practitioners say that it's the most important thing is assessing value compliance, which means that they are checking whether the organization is faithful to its values. They also use their results for, uh, for identifying improvement areas and to enact an improvement cycle and also to inform strategic management decisions. Only in the third, in the fourth case, they were saying that they do it because they want to comply with laws or regulations. 
if you think of it, the first three motivations are quite intrinsic. But when we ask, well, there's more, of course, and you can read that in the paper, but for the sake of brevity, I'll move to the reactions by consultants, which have changed the order in which they think that the, these motivations are important for the clients. And they said that the most important one is because they want to comply with laws or regulations. And the second, because they want to avoid or reduce public pressure, sorry. And only in the third place, it's assessing value compliance. This could be uh, because of two reasons. First could be because of social desirability bias, by which practitioners want to lead their organization in a nice place by showing that they do it for altruistic purposes. Another reason could be that consultants are typically hired by big organizations rather than small and medium enterprises, and big organizations maybe are not so socially oriented as the smaller ones. And so it could be true for bigger ones, but not for smaller ones. We have still not done such an analysis. With respect to the amount of methods that we are collecting, we are creating a, collecting basic information, such as what is the method name, the developer, when it was created, the last version, a lot of documentation about it. And in future projects, we are going to characterize these methods in a number of dimensions. But so far, we're making all this information available in an open science framework project, which is open data. And here you see the table that we are publishing in the paper, which is only the methods we are citing in the paper, but there's, there's more uh, in the repository. Let me cherry pick a few and just mention them because of, uh, for instance, the first one, social accounting and audit has, I, I chose it because of historical reasons. It's one of the first methods that was very well defined and had institutional support by the social audit network and was promoted by the New Economics Foundation. It has several decades already in the market and it's quite well defined and it's very popular in UK, but also in other countries. Nowadays, it's a very popular method is B impact assessment, which qualifies, uh, organizations who applied for being certified big corporations. And it, this is an international network, uh, very present in the States, in the United States, but also uh, coming into Europe through Triodos Bank, who was uh, popularizing it. Then we also have a national network like REAS and CHESS, which is the Catalan network uh, equivalent to REAS, which I mentioned earlier. They apply the social audit or social balance method, which is being applied nowadays by around 1,000 organizations uh, every year in, or in Spain. And they publish uh, aggregated reports, which have even policy pressure. They, they use it to do lobby with the government to show that this way of doing business should be uh, having certain advantages, taxing, public procurement, etc. There are some which are very international and meant for uh, big corporations, such as the United Nations Global Compact or the SDG Compass, which is also supported by United Nations, the World Business for, uh, Council for Sustainable Development and Global Reporting Initiative. And these ones don't have a concrete tool, but they do have a very good method specification and documentation. And finally, the Economy for the Common Good, which is an international initiative, has uh, proposed the Common Good Balance Sheet. I'll provide a few more details about this one. Um, it's an international mostly, but mostly European initiative with a bottom-up and democratic approach. The method was created in 2010, and in this paradigm, earning money and achieving economic growth are not goals by themselves, but just the means to achieve human welfare and quality of life for all company stakeholders. These values are re represented in the common good matrix, which is a taxonomy of common good themes, aka ESG topics in our language. In the intersection here, we see that there's uh, shareholders on the left, column and values on the top row. And in the intersection of each, they define a common good theme, a topic. For instance, uh, B4 is ownership and co-determination, which is the same as workplace democracy. But you also find here uh, environmental sustainability, transparency of governance, etc., and human dignity in the supply chain and things like this. The method is more complex, of course, than just a matrix. Uh, this is the process deliverable diagram. I don't expect you to read it or understand it. For this, you have the paper and the repository online. I have to say just that this is the seventh version of this method and it has been validated with experts. On the left, we have the activities which define the process part. On the right, we have the deliverables which define the artifacts, the, the, the products, the data infrastructure uh, supported by the, that requires, is required by the method. For instance, we have the notion of common good theme here. And I'll just fly you through it to see what the method is and how you should interpret the, the model. But uh, just uh, you see here some shading. The first activity is where the company selects the preferred method variant because uh, this initiative is providing several variants. For instance, one aimed for municipalities, educational institutions, or companies. We focus on the third. Also, there's a full or compact version, uh, depending on how much time and money you have to perform the accounting, and so on and so forth. In the second, it's the biggest and most important activity where you actually measure ESG performance, which basically is gathering indicators and evidences for these claims. They also score the performance in the common good themes, assigning a number of points to each theme. For instance, we are we have 
we should deserve, I don't know, 30 points in workplace democracy. Yeah? And of course, they have to substantiate this with evidences. And they also draft the common report, which also should report on the final sum of all scores, giving a final number, which either serves for comparing companies or more typically to see if you are improving over the years. Then they have to decide if they want to become a member of the network to, to take part in it. And they can ask a certified auditor to assure or certify their, their report, eh? typically by showing them evidences and documentation that prove eh, their, their claims. Finally, the organizations typically communicate their results internally or externally eh, by publishing this as a sustainability report, for instance. Now, a few takeaways. This is already the, the last slide. Uh, there are more ESGA methods than one would imagine. 90 and counting, because there's more. Eh? And it's possible to find similarities and differences, especially if we have such a model like we have. There is a formal approach, with, which we're not reporting in this paper, which allows us to, to find out which are the most common activities and uh, pieces of information. For instance, almost all methods require calculating indicators, key performance indicators, which is, of course, obvious. But not every one of them, for instance, has a certification. We are, uh, with this knowledge, we are developing an open source uh, model-driven ESGA tool, which based on a specific textual specification of a method, we can automatically support it with our tool. There are more, more, more uh, tools like that support accounting in the market, but not so many are as versatile as the one we are developing. Of course, what, what, what should I say? But we, we are proving this in scientific papers as well. There are many open questions. I'll just focus on the two that I find most important, apart from the strengths and weaknesses of each method, et cetera, which is which methods result in truly transformative behavior, the last one. And being more con concrete, what methods can reveal the actual environmental, social, and governance performance of an organization without leaving any space for fabricated or beautified accounts? You know that you cannot trust sustainability reports. There's a lot of greenwashing there, but it depends on the company, right? And it depends also on what method they're applying. So this is what we want to find out. We want to separate this, the straw from the grain, eh? let's say, the wheat from the chaff. And that's it. I, uh, once again, my name is Sergio España, and I thank you also on behalf of Bijanti, Sara, Gudrun, Yuli, and Oscar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio. Very, very interesting uh, study. It seems a very deep investigation full of uh, interesting results. And also, as you briefly tried to, to tell us, full of potentialities for extensions and future works. Uh, I ask if the audience has some questions. OK, I see uh, one question arrives, arrived. Um, thank I you. I see by for Mario, right? Nice Yes, I can read you. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. According to your survey, do you have any idea on which is the most important aspect that companies consider today among social, environmental, and ethical aspects? OK, the short answer is no, but uh, basically because it really depends. Typically, there's two ways of uh, deciding which aspects or uh, topics these companies care about and measure the performance. Uh, one is based on what does the method prescribe. Some methods already prescribe certain indicators, and you have to provide that information if you want to get certified. In other cases, you have to provide uh, to perform a materiality assessment, which is precisely the investigation and selection of topics that are relevant for your organization, depending on the size, context, sector, etc., country, etc. And so it really de depends on the situation. I can tell you something that not many organizations care about, but some of these methods emphasize, which is, for instance, workplace democracy. And I think this is key to transforming the economy. And still not many methods prescribe it. And not many methods have it. For instance, big corporations don't ask about this, if I recall well. Uh, and also the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, don't include it in their standards. But yet other methods, such as the one by REAS and the Economy for the Common Good, they do emphasize that this is critical for them. So I, rather than the most important, I think that the, the 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 not so obvious ones are the ones we should be uh, making political lobby and also uh, scientific efforts to 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 advocate for such as economic uh, democracy let's say thank you thank you very much i also have one curiosity one question for you um if you can provide us uh, some details on what do you think are the main theoretical and practical contributions on this work uh, and also, if you can tell us who can, ben can uh, benefit from the achieved results. OK, I see this particular work uh, as a foundation stone, of course. Um, I think that uh, it provides 
a lot of data and it also tells scientists and practitioners where they can find this data. And uh, this can enable many different types of research as, I, as, as you'll see in the list of, of, of uh, quest open questions. The value per se is of course the set of methods and understanding what the differences and similarities are. As it's, a, it's a state of the art, of course, or in practice, a survey. And also, I think that the motivations are quite interesting. They sort of confirm other studies, uh, earlier research by you know, uh, Rob Gray, which was one of the fathers of this type of accounting, etc. But it goes a bit deeper into understanding the different viewpoints of practitioners and consultants, which is something that was not so obvious uh, so far. So I think that... Uh, there's intrinsic value in the paper, but I think that the value, the, most, the value it provides is that it, it, it should help us and others uh, like move uh, the, the frontiers of knowledge in uh, ESG accounting uh, much further. Thank you. Thank you very much. I agree. Uh, I see that it's always interesting when you put together practical and theoretical contributions and you try to explore those. Uh, in the meantime, I also tell you that Mario Caterino says, thank you very much for your answer. It was very clear and you confirmed what I was thinking on this matter. So Sergio, thank you for, for your interesting presentation. Thank you very much. It has been very Pleasure. interesting. Uh, thank I you think for organizing we can this. On... The... Thank you. I think we can move to the next uh, presenter. Okay, uh, let's pass to the last presentation before the lunch break. Uh, this presentation is titled the OKRs and their role in modern performance management, a critical analysis of benefits, challenges, and integration with traditional tools. I leave the stage to the presenter. Uh, as the others, you will have 15 minutes for the presentation. Uh, so you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Cantini. So, hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Italo Cicidio Fantozzi, a PhD candidate at the University of Rome to Vergata. And today, uh, I will present a work focused on OKRs. And in particular, uh, we will discuss what OKRs are, the requirements for their implementation, and consequently, we'll examine the pros and contras that characterize these monitoring tools. Finally, we will draw conclusions together and evaluate possible developments. But let's start by talking about OKRs. And first of all, what stands acronym uh, of OKRs? Um, the O, it means objective and an objective set the direction, the goal that we want to achieve. And this is typical, the qualitative part of this tool. The second part is represented by the key results. Key results then are quantitative uh, part of the, of the tool and contain a specific target value in order to achieve our objective. Uh, starting from our uh, key results, we can now set some initiatives. And the initiatives are uh, what we have to do, practically speaking, in order to achieve that specific target value and consequently to achieve our objective, our main goal expressed qualitative. And uh, right now, uh, we'll see uh, a simple way to implement an OKR uh, in a human resource sector in a company. So let's now uh, start with the step one, uh, setting an OKR uh, with a simple uh, qualitative statement. Uh, for example, we will drive engagement in order to unleash the full potential of our colleagues. Starting from this statement, we can now derive some key results. For example, we want to drive uh, engagement in order to unleash the full potential of our colleagues by achieving critical talent retention of 95%, by delivering 100% of diversity scorecard commitments, and so on. From these key results, 
we can now derive some initiatives. For example, uh, lead cross-functional talent review uh, by month and years, uh, a precise uh, time frame, and match all critical talents to development opportunities to enable critical talent retention. We can, for sure, uh, implement many, many different initiatives, but they have to combine with our uh, human resource for, with our possibilities, of course. Uh, OKR uh, are a set of an individual and team shared basis, and fre frequently they should be reevaluated. Uh, key results, uh, typically following a quarterly cadence aligned with evaluation of the defined initiatives and objectives uh, can be reevaluated uh, based on year. But in order to implement effectively uh, a set of OKRs, uh, there are some requirements. And uh, typically, you should have to change uh, the way your company uh, think. Basically, there are some uh, way of thinking that are pretty common. For example, uh, trying to achieve everything right now. Uh, we all know that this is not possible, but this is the way typically some company uh, try to achieve everything. So you have to change your focus. You have to change on your objective, on your goal, and to set initiatives accordingly. And of course, uh, if you want to implement your OKRs, OKRs uh, must not be occasionally uh, see on some PowerPoint in a small uh, in a small video call, but uh, they have to uh, introduce in your performance management system in order to achieve effectively your goal and your objective. And uh, of course, we have seen that uh, the second part of our OKR system is represented by the key results. And in order to have uh, reliable uh, uh, values of our OKRs, of our key results, we have to have uh, a reliable metric system. And this is, of course, uh, a challenge for some company, uh, but uh, this is a mandatory in order to achieve an effective OKR system. And there are also some um, monitoring systems uh, such as balanced scorecards that uh, represent a high level strategy systems. And OKRs can, of course, combine with these kind of systems uh, in order to set a middle level uh, objective, middle level goal for different sectors in order to achieve a bigger level of, uh, of the strategy. And uh, this can be uh, high values for, uh, for the company because of the easy way to implement the OKR systems uh, and aligned with the, with the strategy of the company. There are, of course, some benefits and some difficulties in order to uh, implement your OKR system. Um, and for sure, OKR are pretty simple. We have seen uh, just an example a few minutes before. Uh, they are simple if, uh, to, to implement. And uh, uh, yeah, there are, they can create alignment with your organization. But there are some problems because uh, this required uh, discipline in your organization. Because if you don't, if you have uh, employees not uh, disciplined to achieve the kind of goals, uh, the system uh, will not work. And of course, you have to uh, implement a strategy level um, structured, structured in order to set the appropriate goals. Because if you got a disciplined um, group of people, but uh, the, the direction uh, you set the goal uh, is not correct. They can achieve that goal, but in not the appropriate uh, way for your company. And of course, 
you have to uh, implement a reliable uh, measurement, measurement system. If not, OKRs won't work properly or won't work uh, at all. Let's now see that there are uh, for sure some uh, very good development system uh, for uh, OKRs. Uh, they can be implemented in, yeah, balance and scorecard, but also uh, other systems, and they can be uh, used in order to shape uh, your system in a more easy way uh, in order to align all your um, uh, or your employees, but for sure, um, OKR are not a replacement for a uh, balanced scorecard or other management system. They, uh, the key is to learn the principles of, the, of that kind of tools and integrate the, those principles where they fit for your organization. I hope that this brief presentation of the OKR arises your curiosity about it and can uh, uh, align your curiosity. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you want, the, these are my contacts. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation, also for the interesting theme that you, the topic that you discussed today. Um, I ask for questions. Actually, I see that uh, one question already arrived, but also other questions will be very welcomed. Uh, I'm going to read you the question. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Marta Rinaldi says. Uh, in the considerations and use of OKRs as a tool for uh, achieving objectives, is it possible for them to also find applications at a strategic level for the definition of company plans? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marta, for, for the answer. Yeah, uh, OKRs can be effectively utilized at a strategic level uh, in different ways. They can align with company vision and mission, and OKRs provide a structured approach to align company plans with the broader vision and mission. Uh, the top level objectives should reflect the company's long-term goals and aspirations. Um, on the other way, translating vision into actionable objective. So OKRs help translate high-level vision into specific actionable objective. And this ensures that strategic vision is broken down into manageable and measurable components that guide day-to-day -day activities. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much yeah. for this answer. Uh, you also received another question from Saverio Ferraro. Um, I read the question. Thank you for your presentation, Italo. I have a question. What can be the limitations or barriers to the introduction and implementation of OKRs within small and medium enterprises? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, Saverio. This is a um, really nice um, question. And uh, yeah, there could be some challenges for uh, small, medium, small, medium enterprises. Uh, the first is resource constraints, because uh, often small and medium enterprises have limited their resources in terms of personal time and budget, and improving OKR systems may require the, the uh, dedicated time and effort, and as may, may find it challenging to allocate these resources while managing day-to-day -day operations. And other problems could be the lack of strategic alignment. Uh, and we have already seen the problem of uh, the strategic and OKR uh, be aligned. Resistance to change, employees and leadership may resist to shift in mindset and approach that comes with OKRs implementation. And there are also some other problems, just like uh, limited technology infrastructure, communication challenge, uh, measuring key results, um, limited ex ex expertise and short-term focus. I think, yeah, this okay. are the main, the thank main you, challenge. Thank you very yeah. much. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I totally agree with you um, for your, I mean, on this answer. Uh, and I also thank you for your very interesting presentation again. Um, so I think we can um, conclude this first part of uh, presentations. Uh, so we eat a little goodbye. Uh, we are a few minutes late, but we are following uh, almost uh, exactly our scheduling. Uh, so according to this, now we will have the lunch break, um, after which we will continue with the second part of the author's uh, presentation. Uh, based on this, uh, Copperman 2023 will start again at 3 p.m. here, streaming online both on LinkedIn and YouTube. So see you after lunch and I advise you to come back since other five interesting presentations by international authors are yet to come. Bye bye. See you later.
Okay. Welcome back at the second part of the Copperman Conference 2023. So after the lunch break, we are now ready to start with the second session of presentations. In particular, we will now have other five international authors presenting their works on the topic of measuring and managing organizational performance in modern business environments. So accordingly, the next author can jump on the stage. Uh, this author will present us the work titled A Conceptual Framework for Measuring the Impact of Large Practices on Logistics Performance. Uh, I leave you the stage. I leave the stage to the presenter. Uh, you will have the next 15 minutes for showing your presentation. So you're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Alessandra. Can you hear me and see the screen? Yes, I can hear okay. you and I can see the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Saverio Ferraro and I am a PhD student at the University of Florence. Today, I have the pleasure to present the work that I conducted with uh, my colleagues, Alessandra Cantini, Leonardo Leone and Filippo De Carlo, entitled uh, A Conceptual Framework for Measuring the Impact of Large Practices on Logistics Performance. So, uh, to introduce the topic, as all we know, the organization uh, in nowadays uh, dealing with a uh, complex uh, system and context, uh, they focus on uh, multiple objectives. Uh, for example, they try to focus on cost minimization, uh, uh, waste minimization, efficiency maximization, and there are also different players that have uh, different objectives, like uh, the consumers that want uh, different products uh, with a high degree of customization that force organization uh, adopting flexible systems. Uh, we have uh, seen also in uh, um, COVID-19 uh, a, a period uh, that there can be in uh, the context uh, different disruption and changes. Uh, uh, so forcing organization to adopt uh, resilient configurations of their supply chains uh, and also other players uh, like uh, international and national organizations uh, that uh, fixed mid-term goals uh, to uh, thinking about and rethinking the industrial behavior of companies uh, to approach a sustainable future and introduce green practices. All these objectives uh, can be reached uh, with uh, different uh, paradigm, like the one of lean, agile, resilient, and green. And in some cases, uh, the objectives can be opposing. Uh, but one solution is proposed by LARG, so combining the trade-off of different objectives. The LARG concept in the supply chain management field is a, a recent topic compared to the other attributes. It started uh, having re relevance uh, around 2010, but uh, as we can see, the, the integration of the single concept started uh, soon before. Um, in the literature, there are not so much, but different frameworks uh, that uh, propose large paradigm, but uh, lack some kind of approaches in their proposal that uh, understand uh, this big literature about uh, the single practices. And they are applied in this in different industrial contexts, but in the field of logistics, uh, it's not uh, so much studied. So the objective of my research uh, on, of the work is uh, the one to propose a conceptual framework in the logistics management uh, to try to assess the impact of large practices. To achieve this objective, uh, we follow the methodology, basically a, a bibliometric analysis to propose a framework, uh, a conceptual framework uh, on uh, three steps. The first one is the literature search. So we identify the um, relevant publications of the single uh, paradigm. Then we conducted a network analysis uh, with a, a clustering technique of the keywords and uh, about the relationship analysis. And from the results, uh, we propose uh, a framework, uh, try to identify the weights of single uh, paradigm and the relationships, and also some uh, uh, most relevant performance indicators uh, in the logistics management field. So here I report on the results uh, of the single paradigm. The first one is the Lean Paradigm. We included uh, 2,048 articles and from the cluster uh, 
the clustering of the keywords we identify five clusters uh, uh, using a thematic map on the bibliometric software as we can see there is uh, different uh, topics like the sustainability that deals with green practices uh, and the logistics about uh, the logistic management field but we analyze more in detail uh, the relationship and we see that uh, the, the most uh, relevant uh, paradigm related to lean is the one of agile with 62 occurrences while the less uh, relevant is uh, the one of resilient talking about the logistics uh, 103 articles uh, uh, approach the lean paradigm in the logistics management and the most relevant indicators are the one of uh, administrative and operating availability transportation performance and also goods quality Talking about uh, Agile Paradigm, uh, we uh, included a uh, less amount of articles uh, because the literature is, is, less, uh, uh, um, is less developed and we included uh, 1,506 articles. Uh, the clusters identified are seven and here we see more relationship also from the thematic map. Um, going in detail, uh, we uh, analyzed that uh, the, the most relevant relationship between Agile Paradigm is the one of uh, Lean with uh, 73 articles uh, and uh, the last one are uh, more or less the same of Resilient and Green with 10 and, and 13 occurrences. In the logistics management field, uh, Agile Paradigm is less approached uh, with only 38 articles and the most important indicators are the one of volume and product flexibility, the uh, cooperation and integration between the partners and also the information sharing. Talking about the resilient paradigm, uh, also in this case, uh, the literature uh, is less uh, uh, detailed uh, and we included the 1,284 articles. Uh, we identified six keywords uh, through the clustering of the keywords. Uh, and uh, the relationships uh, uh, is not so much evident between the other paradigm. In fact, uh, the occurrence of lean, agile, and green uh, topics uh, are uh, um, of 19, 15, and 14 occurrence. Uh, as for agile uh, field, uh, the resilient, resilient topic is not so much uh, um, developed uh, with uh, 22 occurrence. Uh, and the most important indicators are the one of supply chain visibility, sources criticality, process reliability, and network complexity. The last paradigm is the one of uh, green. Uh, it's, uh, a, can we say, a hot topic in uh, literature for this reason and also about following the exclusion criteria. We included uh, uh, 6,119 articles. Uh, the clustering uh, highlighted the six clusters. Uh, uh, with uh, no relevance about the other paradigm uh, from the thematic map, uh, but all about the process, like the one of green and reverse logistics. But uh, there is some relationship uh, of the other paradigm. The most uh, uh, related is the one of uh, lean approach with uh, 45 occurrences. Talking about the process, uh, green uh, attribute is uh, very uh, detailed with uh, 118 articles and the indicators uh, are the one of uh, greenhouse gases emissions, uh, air pollution, uh, solid and liquid waste generation and also energy consumption. So based on these results, uh, we propose a conceptual framework uh, for the logistics management uh, and we identify also some ways about uh, the single paradigm and the relationship. Uh, we can see that the, the lean paradigm is the one with uh, the highest uh, weight while uh, the resilient and green attribute are, uh, are paradigm less weighted. Talking about the relationships, uh, lean and agile, and but also agile and lean has uh, a high relationships, uh, while the green paradigm is the, the one with less uh, uh, relationships in a uh, weight point of view. Uh, we have also reported the, the most relevant uh, performance indicators of the single paradigm, but we haven't highlighted the impact on the other practices. So uh, going into to the conclusion, uh, in this work we have, we try to propose a, a new conceptual framework uh, for lack practices in logistics management uh, through a network analysis of keywords and their relationships. Uh, 
and uh, also identifying uh, relevant performance indicators for the process uh, of logistics. But as for all uh, the, the works, uh, we have some limitations. Uh, so this the food that can be improved in future development. Uh, the first one is about the uh, occurrence of the relationships. So we are basically uh, counted the number of uh, single terms like uh, lean, agile, resilient, uh, and uh, green and logistics, but not also the other relevant topics uh, like can be sustainability or uncertainty that can be uh, in the same cluster and topic of uh, the paradigm. Uh, the impact of the indicators are assessed only considering the single uh, paradigm, but not the impact on the other paradigm. So it can be useful and interesting to analyze uh, these relationships. And uh, the, the last limitation is that the approach is basically a, a theoretical based uh, proposal. So it could be interesting to evaluate in a more practical way through, for example, uh, practical case studies or interviews and questionnaires. So here are finished. I report on the reference uh, and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Saverio, for your presentation. Uh, I see you already received some comments uh, before reading from some questions, maybe more than comments. Uh, before reading the question, uh, I recall for who uh, connected now that if you want to make any question, any comment, any if you want to ask for curiosities, you can type them as a comment under. Can you hear me? Yeah, now, yeah, hear and see you. Now I, I can uh, hear you and see you, Alessandra. I don't know if the same for you. Okay, I guess maybe Saverio is having some connection problems. I'll try to, if you hear me, I will try to uh, go on. I was saying no. that if you want to type any kind of question or curiosities, you can write it. Uh, So Alessandra is having some connection issues right now. I'm gonna read the questions from the chats of LinkedIn. So the first question is from uh, Professor Marcello Pera of the uh, University of Ambitelli. And the question is, how were the weights calculated for the conceptual framework proposal? Okay, so thank you for the question. So uh, as mentioned before, the approach of uh, proposal of the framework is uh, theoretical. So we counted the keywords uh, considering their occurrence, and then we weighted of the amount of articles included for the single practices. So we have seen that the green paradigm is the one with uh, lots of literature. But uh, in this case, uh, not so many articles dealing, for example, with logistics. So for this reason, is weight and the relationships is uh, uh, lower than the other paradigm, like the one of lean and, and agile. All right. Thank you for your answer. In the meantime, I see that Alessandra has joined us. So I'll make her, uh, let's say, do the other question. Thank you for the question. So I still see that there are some connection issues over there. So let's see where there are some additional questions from the 
uh, LinkedIn page or YouTube channel in case there aren't I think we can go on with the the next presenter all right so thank you so very for being with us today and thank you. Uh, see you next time see you thank you so the next presenter will be uh, Maria from uh, Savkovic from the uh, from the Serbian University. I'm gonna add you to the stage right now. Hi, Maria. Hi. Maria is Good going to, everyone. Maria is going, going to present a paper titled Improving Operators' Performance in a Repetitive Assembly Industrial Task. So if you may share your screen. Uh, I have technical problem to share. Can you uh, do it? I'll, I'll uh, share, if it is not a problem. Screen. Yeah, no, no worries about that. I sent presentation. Um, I'll share the screen for you. You just have to tell me when I have to change okay. the. Okay, uh, no, no problem. Thank you very Good. much. All right, just give me a couple of minutes and I'm going to share with you a couple of seconds. I hope. Okay. And I'm going to share with you the screen with you. So, just a second. Yeah, I just have to find your presentation and then I'm going to share it. So just give me a couple of seconds, please. All right. So here it is. So the floor is yours. Oh, just let yes, me know yes, when I can yes. move forward. Yes, right. thank you very much. Good afternoon again, everyone. I am Maria Sakovic. Uh, I am a, a research assistant uh, on the Faculty of Engineering, University of Kragujevac. Um, I will present a um, research paper. Topic is improving operators' performance in a repetitive assembly industrial tax. Authors are uh, me, Carlo Kajatsu, Nikola Komatina, Marko Japan, and Arsu Vukicevic. Next slide, please. In addition to afford to increase uh, efficiently, reduce costs, and improve the quality of the final products, uh, contemporary organizations are increasingly oriented towards operators and increasing satisfaction and uh, overall well-being. Uh, contemporary manufacturing companies are facing um, ever-increasing competitive pressures which uh, accelerate uh, the necessity of optimizing uh, production process. This uh, dynamics uh, impose the imperative to adapt uh, modern organization to the growing demands of the market, which increasingly uh, gravitate uh, towards uh, personalized and uh, high quality products uh, without deficits. Um, Industry uh, 5.0 promotes a human-centered uh, <clears throat> approach and puts the operator at the center of the production process. Continuous improvement of the manual assembly process plays a primary role in uh, achieving uh, superior operational results, uh, <coughs> increasing productivity and reducing errors. Uh, one of the basic postulates of uh, industry for uh, zero is maximi 
exaggerating uh, productivity and achieving mass production with minimal losses and errors using uh, new contemporary technologies. Um, although industry uh, for zero technologies strives to reach the concept of uh, fully automated factories, smart factories, that can work without the di direct uh, presence of the workers uh, in production process, uh, there is still a need uh, for manual operation in production process. Uh, this is uh, especially uh, noticeable with monotone repetitive uh, tedious assembly task and activities where it is not possible to fully automate. Uh, de therefore, uh, it can be said that improving workers' productivity and uh, reducing uh, defects when performing these uh, activities and tasks is a special uh, challenge. Ergonomic standard uh, out as a key tool in improving the efficiency and effectiveness of assembly work systems by adapting the working environment to the needs and limitation of the operator. On the one hand, injuries and occupation disease are reduced, and on the other hand, the productivity and quality of the final products are increased. Um, the application of lean and ergonomics principle during the design of the workstation and the optimization of working condition contributes to the improvement of operator performance and overall system performance and has a positive uh, effect on the operator's well billing in general. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, the main goal of this research paper is to show that the proposed newly designed modular assembly workstation has increased operator productivity, reduced the number of defective products, and increased operator satisfaction. Um, we want to show that the impact of ergonomics optimization on, <clears throat> on the key parameters of the production process, uh, productivity of workers, and the quality of the final products. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we used in research paper two methods, experiment and uh, question and interview. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, we <coughs> conducted the experiment in two uh, scenarios, in the traditional scenario and uh, in the ergonomics. Uh, Scenario in the research paper, the time needed to perform the activity and the defects uh, were analyzed. Um, by analyzing the time and defects that uh, occurred during the execution of assembly activities in uh, both scenario, it was established uh, to what uh, extent there uh, was an increase in productivity and the reduction of defects in the ergonomic scenario compared to the non ergonomics. Scenario. In this study, uh, five participants were considered. Uh, they performed the experiment under um, non-ergonomics and ergonomic scenario uh, in two sessions in both scenario. In each uh, session, uh, participants uh, were tasked with uh, completing uh, 75 shames. Uh, the experiment involved uh, assembling the finished product by inserting blue wires from the container into a part made of plexiglass and uh, closing the switch according to the diagram displayed on the monitor. They had uh, 16 seconds for easy shams and uh, 19 seconds for hard uh, shams. Um, between session, uh, participants had a short uh, break of uh, 15 minutes. Uh, before experiment, participants received the initial instructions, and after that, uh, they uh, practiced performing assembly activities for 15 minutes. Before the start of the experiment, the participants uh, were played, um, were listened, uh, relaxing music for five minutes. Uh, 
in the traditional scenario, uh, necessary components and parts uh, are arranged on the workstation without talking uh, into count ergonomics principle and lean manufacturing principles outside the zone of normal and maximum reach of the exam. Uh, basket of uh, parts uh, from plexiglass was placed under the workstation on the right uh, side and the basket of finished products were placed on the floor uh, to the subject's left and um, this required additional bending by the subject. Uh, the second part of the experiment was conducted uh, on the proposed new ergonomics uh, workstation that is aligned with lean principles and uh, adapt uh, to the individual characteristics of the operator. All containers and equipment are aligned with the green zone so that uh, workers are freed from uh, performing unnecessary movements, bending and reaching uh, to reducing the risk of musculoskeletal disorders and other uh, occupation disease. A uh, subject satisfaction was uh, seen uh, through the oral interview uh, after experiment and the questioner at the end of the experiment in uh, the both scenario, in traditional scenario and in ergonomic scenario. Immediately after the experiment, the respondents uh, respond uh, to an oral interview and a few days after the experiment, they filled out um, questionnaire that was sent uh, to them by email. The questions are related to satisfaction while performing activities at the new workstation. Report, uh, uh, participants also had the opportunity to explain um, what problems they faced when performing activities at the traditional um, workstation and uh, which is uh, suggestions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, on uh, slide, we can see uh, traditional scenario and ergonomic scenario. Next slide, please. Uh, next. Okay. Uh, I will uh, present the results. Um, of non-ergonomic scenario, results of ergonomic scenario, and the table which explains time spent on defective parts. Uh, next uh, slide, please. On table one, uh, we can see the results of the experiment for the non-ergonomic scenario. On second slide, we can see uh, results of the experiment for the ergonomic scenario. <clears throat> next slide. Uh, by comparing the recorded results, it can be concluded that the participants achieve significantly better results in the ergonomic scenario compared to the non-ergonomic scenario because the session one uh, on average is shorter by about 405 seconds, while session two is on average about 346 seconds shorter in the ergonomic scenario. This means that uh, participants in the ergonomic scenario complete both session approximately 751 seconds early or about uh, 20 minutes early compared to the non-ergonomic scenario. Also, the, de the defect uh, percentage was reduced on average by uh, 4% in the second one and 3% in the section two in the ergonomic uh, scenario. Um, we can conduct that the ergonomic scenario significantly uh, contribute to the improvement of performance for participants who had uh, poor results in the traditional experiment. Um, as conclusion, uh, we can see that according to the results of uh, the study, the performance on the new ergonomical design workstation has improved compared to the traditional non-ergonomic design assembly workstation, and this can be seen. Uh, you can put uh, next slide. 
And uh, this can be seen through the reduction of time required to perform activities and the reduction of defects. Um, the main limitation of uh, this study are related to number of respondents and the fact that only male respondents uh, participated in the experiment. In the future period, uh, we plan to conduct um, experiment on a large number of subjects and um, combine the results with uh, EG, MG results uh, in order to see in depth the contribution of ergonomics uh, optimization to the improvement of production process. Uh, our aim uh, is improving the effectiveness of production process and improving the satisfaction of operators who perform a repetitive assembly task, uh, conducting advanced research involving EG, EMG, and uh, eye tracking technique will uh, provide deeper insight into how mental load and external factors uh, can affect on productivity and the occurrence of defect during the performance of mentally and physically demanding and uh, repetitive uh, monotony assembly activities. Thank you on attention. Okay, uh, thank you, Maria, for your presentation. Sorry also for my previous uh, connection problems. Um, no. Are there questions uh, for this presentation? Yes, uh, I see you have a question. Uh, you already received uh, a question. I'm going to read it. Uh, the first one is, uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Regarding the sample size and generaliz generalizability, this study engaged only five respondents to perform assembly tasks in both ergonomic and non-ergonomic scenarios. How do you justify the sample size and to what extent do you believe the results can be generalized to a broader population of operators? Would, you, would increasing the sample size potentially lead to a significant statistical association between the total time spent and defective parts? Uh, yes, uh, we uh, put results of correlation analysis in our research paper, but we have a limitation of time and... <laughs> Um, on uh, in a research paper, we can see results of um, correlation analysis. Um, okay, so you consider uh, increasing the sample size in an extended version of this paper in future work? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, thank you for this answer. Uh, another question comes from the, the audience. Uh, I read it. Thank you for the presentation. Regarding the EEG and uh, EMG integration, you've mentioned uh, the intention to integrate the electroencephalogram and electromyogram results in future research to deeply examine the benefits of ergonomic optimization. Can you provide a preliminary discussion on how these measures would enhance the understanding of ergonomic benefits? Specifically, what insights or metrics from EEG and EMG do you anticipate would be most relevant to the study objectives? Uh, at the moment, we continue to conduct experiments. Uh, to monitor um, by EEG and EMG muscle activity and uh, brain activity. Uh, in future period, we will uh, use the um, index of mental workload to as, as for assessment of uh, mental and cognitive uh, workload and uh, muscle fatigue index to uh, for assessment uh, muscle um, particle um, activity and 
and muscle activity and uh, uh, we focus on trapezial muscles and we will put a sensor on this place on body okay thank you yes uh, very interesting and also very interesting kpis to be measured we want okay. to show that uh, mental and cognitive and muscle workload uh, have a direct uh, impact on operator's performance yes very interesting consideration thank you by by me and also by the uh, the audience okay uh, thank, you. thank you maria i think we can pass to the next presenter uh the next presentation is titled leveraging micro enterprise sustainability sdg 8 and 9 through lean manufacturing approach uh i ask the presenter to to join me on the stage if he can or she can she can maybe yes good morning good morning sophia Hello. thank you for being good here morning. Uh, so I leave the stage to you. You will have the next 15 minutes for your presentation and then a Q&A session. Okay, thank you. I will present. Yes. I don't know if you can see. Not okay. It's loading. Yes, I see the PowerPoint, and now it's in the presentation mode. Yes. So is you it can okay? Thank you. Yes, it's okay. Thank you. If you can okay. uh, remove the the banner uh, at the bottom of the slide, hide it. But for the rest, what banner? Thank sorry. You. I I guess you have the. Yes, uh, StreamYard está compartiendo, etc. If you can hide it, it would be great. Um, this one. Okay. Can you hide it? Okay, now you go. Okay, thank you very much. Perfect. Okay, Perfect. hello everyone. My name is Sofia Guarino. I'm from Argentina. And I will present uh, the name of my project is uh, Liberation Micro Enterprise Sustainability Through Lean Manufacturing Approach. Uh, in Latin America, 99% of companies are micro, small, and medium sized enterprises. So they are a vital component in the uh, productive network in all the countries. Usually, uh, the um, micro and small enterprises are generated uh, um, as an informal or a family organization, and they uh, start to grow, the demand increase, and they can't uh, satisfy this demand because uh, they are disorganized and they don't have a, a clear growth uh, strategy. So, given this situation, United Nations proposed to improve working conditions and economic growth in the Sustainable uh, Development Goals 8 and to improve industry and innovation in SDG 9. This is the case study of a Brazilian micro, micro enterprise that specializes in the development of color and painting of metal and plastic parts. And their needs was a workplace more organized and orderly, and also they need to improve productivity and customer service. So the objectives of the uh, consulting team was a uh, focus on lean manufacturing approaches. One of them was uh, the analysis of the distribution of the facilities in the plant. Um, it's for optimize the production. 
and also the application of the 5S methodology uh, that it's to achieve a more organized workplace with the aim of achieving a greater productivity. We start having a meeting with the uh, owners of the company to learn about the plan, the operators and the process. We did a production process diagram that is under ISO standard, that is to understand the process and how the facilities are used. And we measure all the space and the facilities in the plant to do a spaghetti diagram using a program that is uh, AutoCAD. And uh, with this diagram, we can identify if we have a um, traffic interference that occur when flow lines cross at some point and recall that it's the um, backward moment, the material in the plant, um, that means when the same path is, has already traveled and um, the distant travel costs money. So the less travel you, uh, you will do, it's better. Here we have the initial layout. We measure and the lines, the initial travel distance is 52 uh, meters. So we uh, made them some recommendations uh, for the new design. First of all, uh, they have to improve the handling and storage of raw materials and finished products. They don't have a specific space for uh, the materials. They had to redesign the work centers. For example, the water tank, it's uh, very far for the, uh, from the productive flow. Also, they had to rotate some tables um, to facilitate manipulation of the working process, and they had to define the different work areas. We can see here the, the improved layout. We can see the different areas that are defined. Uh, they are, um, it's marking on the, on the ground, the different work areas. They have an area that it's planned and on an, another area that is to be planned. Um, they have the tables rotator. Uh, so we measure all the, the lines, the new flow and the current path is uh, 32 meters that it's a path reduction of almost 40%. In the other part of our project, we apply the 5S methodology, that it's, uh, it has five categories that it sort, um, that it separates the elements that are necessary or not necessary, straighten, that it's to set in order everything, a shine that is to clean and maintain clean the a work environment, standardize that is about continuous improvement and sustain that it's a, that the rules that we do have to be a follow in the time. So first of all, we did a current situation uh, diagnosis and we can see here that the facilities was occupied by objects completely unrelated to the production process. We can see a bed, a bags, a boxes. Um, they don't have an assigned place for the tools, products or materials. And also the floor, the walls, windows and machines were stained and covered in dust. Uh, to formalize this 5S methodology, it was used a self-diagnosis methodology using indicative tables. And uh, each of the answer has an associated score varying between one and 20 points. Uh, where one is the worst scenario and 20 is the maximum possible. 
we can see if we're um, correct, they had to be a, a big pentagon. And here it's very small, so we can see that it's a really poor performance. So we did the recommendations to improve processes. First of all, the necessary elements must be discriminated from the unnecessary one. We used the visible split procedure, that is to put cars, red cars in the elements with the destination of the element that can be discard, return, uh, donate, or save. Uh, also, the new arrangement of the elements that I said before. Also, they had to organize the chemical warehouse, putting the painting that they use most at the front of the shelves, and they had to clean the sector and make a cleaning plan. It means to allocate the lads, for example, 10 or, five or 50 minutes of each workday to carry out a cleaning tasks. Here we can see in the pictures the before and the after, um, after the, the project and the recommendations. As conclusions, we can say that recommendations made by the consultant team and the actions carried out proved to, the, to, proved, proved to be effective in response to the need initially raised by the company. Uh, also, the reduction of uh, almost 50% in the, in the route taking is considered a very significant improvement. And finally, that it's really important, the joint work of the advisors with the company and mainly the acceptance of the owners and the, work of, and the workers that are the ones who has to maintain uh, all the, the work done. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I again ask uh, if somebody of the listeners have questions. Yeah. I also have one curiosity. Uh, it, it seems to me a very interesting study. I see that you used a lot of lean tools uh, such as uh, 5S, uh, spaghetti chart and so on. So mm -hmm. more than a question mine, it's a curiosity about the, the, the tool used to map the process. I see that you use the ISO standard, uh, ISO standard. So I was wondering why did, you, I mean, have you considered using, for example, a value stream map or another lean tool also for mapping the process? Uh, yes, the diagram from for, was used to understand the process and the ISO standard um, make a reference that, uh, for example, the circle, it's an operation. Um, and it was uh, only to, to understand better the process and to order uh, and understand the, their process, their productive process. OK, thank you. So yeah. Uh, it was just a cho your choice, okay? Yes, understood. Yes. Thank you. Okay, in the meantime, I see you received a question from the audience. Uh, Saverio Ferrero says, Hi, Sofia, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. I have the following question. In using the self-diagnosis tool to assess the application of 5S, were the judgments of experts somehow weighted experience, age, role, or other? I didn't understand the, the last part, sorry. I see. Uh, I, the, the question is, when using the self-diagnosis tool to mm -hmm. assess the application of 5S, did yes. you somehow weight the judgments of experts, for example, based on their experience, their age, their role, or not? Uh, yes, the self-diagnosis uh, was made by the owners of the company and uh, the consulting team that was from, uh, from a, a consultancy team of a Senai, that is a, an technology institute, but was a, 
a self-diagnosis made with a critical sense. Okay, so all the judgments uh, by your experts uh, had the same weight uh, in your study. Yes. No differences. Yes. Yes, okay. it was um, in, a, in a team. Yes, okay, thank you very much, Sofia. Thank you for this presentation. I think we can pass to the next uh, presentation. Now it's time to move to uh, the next paper, uh, which is titled OEE Review and Compatible Weighting Approach for OEE by Herman Tang. Herman, good morning. I leave you the stage. You will have the next 15 minutes for your presentation. I see your slides already. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon over there. Yeah, here is a uh, local time, it's still morning. And uh, it's a very good opportunity to share our uh, study and the thought regarding this topic. And uh, I also hope I can visit into Italy and very soon because the way visit there as it's uh, before COVID, it's a beautiful city. We stay in uh, Rome and the Francis yeah, a few days. And uh, yeah, let's uh, talk about today's topic. I think the topic is about this OEE review, and also we proposed uh, it's a new waiting approach. Then we can uh, deal with kind of a special need and emphasize when they're using this uh, KPI. And uh, for this uh, presentation or this uh, study, actually we have uh, four sections. And the first one is regarding this, uh, uh, the basic uh, background introduction of this uh, OEE methodology. And the second one, yeah, let me see. The second one is uh, it talk about a little bit of kind of details for the individual elements of the OEE, and particularly in this paper, I'm not sure today we have a time to deal with the details regarding this uh, one. We're using a, a OEE as a KPI, and uh, what is kind of a room or potential opportunities we can improve? What is the lim limit there? The third section is at the core. Is the central part of this uh, study. Yeah, as is a way reviewed the current existing waiting processes or projects, processes, and also propose a new one, how we have the new uh, comparable uh, OEE. And then there's a last uh, it's a conclusion of this uh, study. Uh, due to the time, I think that probably I can spend a little bit more time on the, the third one, but um, the the others, I think that we can quickly go through for this presentation. So here is kind of a, a basic introduction and review. And the OEE, we all know that uh, we have we have uh, three elements: uh, operational availability, A, performance or speed, P, and uh, the product quality, just a Q. So in other words, if you we were talking particular production, because I have kind of so many years in the vehicle assembly plants uh, in the production floor, as is, uh, we talk about this uh, for each element, we may have a kind of a corresponding losses due to the particular area. So in other words, OEE is a composite, is a, a comprehensive uh, KPI for the production performance. Just an example, for example, here, I'm not sure you can see my mouse. But I think, so, for example, in the, the, the figure, the uh, chart on the right side, now we can see as a, for each elements, we have a kind of a, product, a production downtime that's a, a directly associated with availability. And uh, the cycle time, for example, uh, is directly related to speed or performance. For example, if the cycle time is a 60 seconds and actual cycle time is a 61 seconds, that means uh, this kind of about a one second uh, slower than the design or than expected. The, the top one on the, on the chart is uh, quality, the product quality, and uh, we may have a kind of, uh, in the 
OEE calculation normally we consider the first time pass, meaning is that we may not consider the repairs or rework or reprocess because uh, they are going to need additional resources. Uh, but as I said, they can uh, create as a, a quality rate, but it's not really part of the OEE calculation. And uh, the lower on the right side, lower part, lower chart is uh, showing is showing the relationship between the OEE calculation with individual elements. We, we, we can assume, for example, we have a three elements there, but uh, we can assume uh, the other two are constant or unchanged. So in other words, OEE is a proportional, directly proportional to any one of the elements. The interesting thing is on the left lower part, this is, kind of, is, this, is a figure, it's a kind of 3D presentation, it's a 3D graphics. So in other words, when we are working on the production floor, we, we run this uh, continuous improvement the projects, we may uh, improve with the three elements simultaneously, but even different at a different uh, amount or levels. So in other words, for example, this kind of, uh, because now the, uh, the share screen, I think so. for example, the original state or current state is OEE one, but this current state. And after this kind of a continuous improvement project effort on the implementation, we could reach OEE two. And during the process, yeah, we may have kind of three uh, elements changed or improved simultaneously. So it's, it's kind of interesting thing is kind of in the three D uh, uh, world. Right, this kind of OEE is kind of what it kind of looks like. But uh, this uh, 3D presentation is not uh, very often because it's a little bit complicated to draw. But uh, just to give you information, overall, this OEE is kind of a, a composite, comprehensively present the three major aspects of a production performance. Okay, here is a kind of a current existing uh, waiting process, a uh, waiting approach. For example, the first one they consider they just put on this a coefficient in the front is just a multiple get as a product the product for example uh, WA is a coefficient weight for availability A. So in other words, this kind of a uh, one way to weight the individual uh, elements of the OEE, and also they propose the condition. Yeah, on screen is that's kind of a little bit overlap. As the three ways come together, is equals one. It's a requirement their proposal. So in other words, it's kind of by calculate the weighted OEE, the second line. Then you can see the weighted OEE is not very comparable to original AE. Right. So in other words, if we consider as no weight or equally weighted. So this, this method, this approach is not really directly comparable with uh, regular OEE. The similar way is another one is a Rolf's kind of weighting approach. They're using as a kind of uh, exponent or power of this uh, individual elements. Right? And also they, they required or they, they propose this condition as a three elements, three elements weights combined is uh, one. So th this is another similar issue. There's a kind of inf good information, good consideration, but uh, one, we don't have a kind of a, this weight or equal weight, equally weighted. Then the, the weighted OEE is not comparable with the kind of regular OEE. So in other words, we, when we work on the floor, we normally have kind of regular OEE and we may have kind of different weighted OEE, but we like to both type as OEE comparable, comparable, right? So we can see what's the difference, why they have kind of different value from the weighted OEE. And uh, here we propose the new weight uh, approach. So this one, we still keep this kind of a exponent for every elements. But uh, this uh, condition for this one is uh, we need a three base. Sum of the three base is uh, three equals three. 
So in other words, when they are, the weights are equal, then we have the same regular OE, just kind of a, the, the, the second line of the equation. So the question remaining using this new approach is how do we decide weight? So this is kind of a, the detailed three steps, how to decide the weight for this new approach. The first one is uh, we determine the reading based on the team consensus or based on this kind of floor production people or the uh, senior management. Then the, they can decide the readings for each element. Here is an example in, in the scale of uh, <clears throat> one to 10. So for this example, for example, we have kind of five to nine assigned as a weight for APQ respectively. So this is just an example. Then the second step is uh, we need to calculate the, the coefficient for these uh, three weights. For example, this one, we just kind of add the three numbers together is a 16. The third one is uh, we need to calculate, calculate uh, uh, each, uh, each weight. And so, so here is kind of a, and then the kind of, I can see it's a weight should be this, uh, for example, phi for A divided by its coefficient, then get the weight. So here is a, just an example, right? Just an example to show uh, uh, how we use this, uh, o, this new approach weighted OEE and then compare with uh, regular OEE. So this example is a way, way around this production in 10 weeks. We have uh, the first three uh, parameters, APQ is individual KPI or elements of the OEE. And uh, the next line is a regular OEE. Uh, this kind of a calculator is a product of these three elements. And the weighted OEE here on the very last row is uh, we put on the weights, just an early example of the, the, the numbers. So as is, uh, for example, after we run this kind of continuous improvement project, for example, the first one, we change, we improve availability at this kind of first yellow area, then the increase the availability from 88.8% to 91.4%. So just an example, right? And on the similar way, when the later on, when we run this kind of a, a particular uh, CI project, and then we improve the performance in the second yellow area. And then we run another uh, CI project to get this uh, quality improvement. That's, kind of, that's, a, that's the third yellow area. So in other words, we run this kind of three individual separate uh, continuous improvement project, and then we calculate the OEE and the weighted OEE, assume uh, with kind of a weight we discussed before. So here is kind of interesting thing comparison, right? It's a kind of a, we have a two lines. The black is a regular OEE. Right? When you change something, you have can, you can see the improvement because you in, in, increase or improve one element. And then that's kind of OEE as a composite, you know, you're getting better. So this uh, black line is a regular OEE. And uh, for it's kind of blue line is a weighted for this particular case. Right. So you can see just an example one by one. Yeah, when we improved the operational availability, for example, the fourth column, then you can see it's improved, right? It's kind of a OE improved and also weighted improved. The interesting observation here is that these two lines is a parallel. Why? Because we have the weight as a phi, phi in the scale of one to 10, so in the, the middle. In other words, it's kind of a little bit average, right? So it's, you, you can see, you do uh, see this, uh, this kind of a weighted OEE changed based on this improvement on the operational availability. The second project focus, focus on the, uh, the performance. The performance, as is, uh, they changed. Interesting is uh, you can see, it's a black line, it's a, you can see the increase. But it's a blue line weighted, it's relatively small. 
the slope is almost flat. It's not significant for the weighted OEE because, because the weight have a very low weight, two out of 10 for this particular case. So in other words, this one is not obvious in the weighted OEE. The third case is on the quality improvement right? because uh, we put on this kind of very high weight on this uh, this uh, quality aspect, nine out of 10. So in other words, on the weighted, you can see significant change. So interesting is kind of, uh, when you're using this, this just uh, for summary, when we come back, compare this kind of regular OEE, we, we do see the improvement. But when we put on the weights on the individual elements, then you can show the different result, the different slopes, right? It's kind of a, it's, so in, in, it's up to the kind of, for example, the senior management or kind of a, the professionals on the floor, which elements is more important. And then you can see the OEE, uh, weighted OEE calcul calculation. So this is uh, pretty much as a kind of a meaning of the uh, weighted OEE based on the new approach. And it's a very, very 100% uh, uh, compatible with kind of regular ACE. Meaning is kind of we can use both side by side along with, and then you can compare. You have a kind of better or then deeper understanding of this kind of uh, uh, improvements on the production floor. The, okay, the last one, this is, uh, I don't have to read the conclusions. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, if you like it later on, you can read this, uh, uh, my paper is kind of a full length paper, has a detailed discussion, detailed, detailed steps. And also here's my con contact information. Uh, you're welcome to contact me if I have any questions, you you like to have kind of a more uh, further discussion, so on and so forth. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, it's time for the questions. Uh, I see you have two. Uh, so I'm going to read the, the first question. The first question is, have you considered any potential drawbacks or limitations of the new compatible weighting approach for OEE? Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, this one, I think, uh, is kind of... Uh, because uh, to me, from the one way I developed this kind of uh, this new approach, we thought, oh, this is kind of a little bit challenging for the floor people understand it because we treat this a different, differently on the elements, right? And uh, another question or another challenging is uh, some people might have kind of different opinions, right? For example, this in, in the case uh, we discussed here, we put on the highest, uh, the emphasize on the quality side, right? Some people maybe not necessarily agree with, oh, uh, they are more concerned regarding the downtime. So in other words, it's a, a team discussion and consensus and regarding the ways. And also, I think uh, we need a little bit more training or explanation why the weighted OEE is uh, different from regular OEE. Thank you. Thank you for this answer. Uh, the other question is, uh, thanks for the presentation. Are there any situations or scenarios where the approach of the weighted OEE is particularly suitable? Is a particular, I'm sorry, say again. Is where, where this new approach of the weighted OEE is particularly suitable. Are there oh, any okay. situations? Yeah, I just uh, right now, to be honest, this is just a new approach proposed. Uh, I just kind of, uh, my observation is uh, the people used to or prefer as regular OEE, right? Because they have been using it for years. Right now, when, when we introduce kind of uh, this uh, weighted approach, and then uh, it's kind of very, I think by nature is kind of, uh, they can raise a lot of questions, right? So in other words, this is kind of depending on if you treat this kind of three aspects, three KPIs, availability, performance, or quality equally, or you prefer for your particular operation, you say, oh, quality is number one for us. Yeah, we're not very concerned regarding the slowness or 
the downtime, right? But uh, we we like to emphasize the quality. So in that in that case, I think probably it's a better situation. You will like you will like to consider a high weight or heavier weight on this quality. Just an example here, and uh, then uh, you can try out. I would say it's kind of a try and error. You can see the weight is appropriate and the C is gonna make more sense. Why you, I'm not suggesting to replace regular, but I think I'm suggesting it's kind of a try to using it parallelly and simultaneously, simultaneously, and then kind of see what is kind of the meaning for as a, the particular operation production. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much also for this answer. Thank you for the presentation. I think I think it's now time to move to the next uh, and the last and not but not least author. So I ask the next presenter to jump uh, on the stage. I also anticipate you that you have a fun club uh, listening to you because there you. is uh, Alan Ortiz uh, saying saludos a uh, Alonso Yoko Picio y a todos los mio tai. So you have a fun club listening to you. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, it's now time to move to your work titled Design of a Machine Learning Model in CRM to Identify Leads in an IT Company. So I leave you the stage. Uh, you will have 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. OK, um, I'm going to share my uh, screen. Uh, hold on. Okay, uh, thank you for your time. And this is uh, uh, the presentation in Copenhagen 2023 conference. The presentation name is Design of a Machine Learning Model in Custom Relationship Management to Identify Leads in an IT Company. Authors, Alonso Yocupicio Sasueta, I'm the presenter, Agustin Brau Avila, and Federico Siret Galán. Agenda, introduction, methodology, results, and conclusions. Introduction, customer relationship management, better known as CRM, is an enterprise system to manage relationship with client contacts and opportunities. The information that comes that uh, has CRM come from uh, marketing uh, campaigns and to bring more prospect to the database and this prospect will be called leads in this presentation. The implementation of a machine learning model is proposed in this presentation to qualify leads and better know what are the, the ones that will be converted into um, real customers. Problem statements. Studies have shown that salespeople only contact 30% of leads, according to Savnit Car of 2013, uh, while the rest of um, leads keep in, in the database without being contacted. In an inspection of an IT company database, uh, we noticed that only 25% of leads are contacted uh, using a phone call, agenda, uh, and other activities or emails, for example. Uh, and we are going to explore a machine learning that could help us to increase qualified leads. General objective, to identify potential customer in an IT company through artificial intelligence using software that incorporate machine learning tools. Specific objective, to create a Windows form application using C Sharp for marketing interaction extraction from CRM. To create a model in Jupyter Notebook using Python to categorize job titles. 
and to analyze through data mining techniques the process of qualifying leads. Let's review some concepts like logistic regression, confusion matrix, and metrics first. And logistic regression is a statistical analysis method to predict binary outcomes such yes or no based on prior observation of a data set. This is the equation for logistic regression where the probability is equal to one divided uh, between one plus the Euler constant uh, with exponent to minus y, where mean, uh, y is this equation, where b beta zero to beta k are regression coefficient estimated from the data. A, thres a threshold uh, equal to 0 0.5 is needed that allows to binarily to classify or data set into converted or not converted using various features or independent variables, x1 to xk, to describe all records. This is the confusion matrix for uh, binary classification problems, and we are interested to get good results for true positive and true negative. True positive is the number of samples belonging to class one that were also classified as class one. True negatives are the number of samples belonging to class zero that were also classified as class zero. And we need some metrics to measure the performance. And one of the metrics is uh, accuracy which is true positive plus true negative divided in true positive plus true negative plus false positive plus false negative. So uh, is uh, these two between the, the total squares in the matrix. And the methodology used in this work is data preparation, feature selection, model training, and measure performance. For uh, the feature selection, we uh, selected state or province, annual revenue, number of employees, industry, job title, and some marketing, marketing interactions like email open, email click, website visit, website uh, open, and form submitted. The class, uh, which is, this is um, supervised algorithm, so we need a uh, output uh, column or variable, which is the dependent variable, we use converted, whether the lead has been converted to client or not. The data collection, we export the record from the previous CRM, which is dynamic CRM to a file, and database containing 26,606 records and only 2.1% were class one or converted. Created a C-sharp program, uh, for application to extract marketing interaction from CRM. Uh, query interaction from October 10, 2020 to May 5, 2022. Queried uh, the number of interactions, email open, email clicks, etc. using uh, MS Dyn CRM load interaction pull request message from the SDK and populated interaction columns in, in the file which is this part of, this is the data set, the data set and in the state or province, we see the whole name of the state in the, in the United States. Some of them has two letters. The job title contains some stop words or contain multiple job title in the same column. Um, the last column is our um, dependent variable, which is zero for not converted and one for converted. We use a uh, experiment using a uh, Jupyter notebook. So um, a local computer was prepared with Windows 11, uh, Python, Anaconda distribution, and Jupyter extension for Visual Studio were installed. We use Science Kit Learn for logistic regression, the natural language toolkit to predict a clean value of job title. The results using the Jupyter notebooks are um, we created perform five experiments and the first one with 435 record of class zero, same for class one, seven attributes, 70 and 30 percent of uh, train and test respectively. We obtained 41.74 percent of accuracy. 
So in order to increase our accuracy, uh, we changed the number of records on class zero, uh, same number of attributes, strength and test, and obtain a 66.94%. Uh, the next experiment, we increase the records in class zero, uh, added another column, which is job title, uh, where we created a model using natural learning processing. And we obtained 79.04%. And uh, for experiments, same number of records, but we added a column, which is industry, but using one hot encoding, which I am going to explain in the next slide. And those uh, training tests, and we obtained 80.5% of accuracy. However, the first four experiments, we didn't get a good uh, confusion matrix, so they were discarded. And the fifth experiment uh, is the one that we selected to use um, in, in this result with 533 records of class zero, same number of class one. And in this, uh, it was used label encoding and the accuracy was 67, 8, uh, one percent. The job titles in the database, uh, the main were, were a director, manager, and vice president. So um, the natural learning processing was used. First, we label all the job titles um, variable or column, and then perform this model. Uh, so the next time that when we receive a value of a uh, dirty value for um, job title, it will obtain a clean value. Also, uh, we um, assign a number to the job titles going from unknown to founder president uh, to the number 70. This is the one hot encoding I talked uh, before. It is uh, the way how this works it creates dummy variables to encode the same information with ones and zeros. Uh, it use Panda, get dummies using Python. For example, marketing in this column, virtual column it has one. Uh, if say agriculture in the dummy column for agriculture, it's, it has a one. For state, uh, province and their divisions, um, we notice in the data set that the state contains some um, whole names of the states. Uh, this is a IT company at the US in the East Coast. So it was analyzing, dividing in region and then in divisions. For converted uh, leads, we can see here that we have 300 in the East Coast. So it's a clue that it gives us a clue that this is a good region uh, for list that can be converted. This is the confusion matrix uh, that we obtained in the experiment field, where uh, we obtained 67.81% uh, and the total number of uh, records for, for this um, testing was this number. So through positive 95, through negative 122. Conclusion, as explained in this work, a Windows 4 application was developed in C Sharp to extract market interaction from CRM. A model to categorize job title was created using natural learning processing. CRM leads data was analyzed using Python and data mining techniques, and a machine learning model was designed and trained to predict leads conversion. This will help business development staff to make decisions and make better use of resources, focusing efforts on leads that are the best qualified to become true customers. Thank you for your attention. And this is our the contacts of our authors. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the question for you already arrived from the audience. And this question is, uh, are you planning to include the specific feature selection approaches to further pre-process the data? 
Well, the features that were selected in this paper were, were based on, on the expertise of the business developers. However, of course, for feature development, we can include particular features that are more uh, useful for uh, another company. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation and very deep work. Um, thank you for being here. I think we can now move to the closure of this uh, section, session. Uh, okay, uh, it's time to say some thanks and to provide some final uh, comments. Before moving to thank uh, a few people, I want to tell you that the scientific committee uh, of Copperman 2023 has decided to assign two awards uh, of the presentations uh, today uh, shown. Uh, first of all, for the interesting work presented, the relevance to the conference team and the theoretical and practical implications of the achieved results, we decided to assign the best paper award to the paper by Sergio España et al. So congratulations to the authors. Uh, as for the best presentation award, uh, for the clarity of exposition, the interest aroused in the Copperman Scientific Committee during the slide presentation, and the effectiveness in conveying the work done, uh, the award for the best presentation goes to Salim Alami and Karim Sharaf. So congratulations to the authors for this uh, award. Uh, you will receive certificates at the end of this session. Okay, now to conclude very briefly this daily conference, um, I want to say a few thanks. Thanks to the keynote speakers, uh, Dennis Brendel and Andrea Franzetti Coladon for attending this conference and offering us very interesting lectures. It has been an honor to have you here as our guests for today. Thanks also to the authors and presenters for discussing innovative contributions on performance measurement and management systems, key performance indicators, and so on. Uh, thanks to the colleagues of the International Scientific Committee for organizing this conference, and thanks for uh, having me here hosting this, uh, this session. And finally, thanks to the audience. And before concluding, I want to switch to the next slide, since I'm glad to anticipate you a good news. We are actually already working on the next Copperman 2023, 24, sorry. <laughs> So uh, I wish you hope you enjoyed this uh, conference this year, and I wish you to see you next year uh, for Copperman 2024. Stay tuned. Thank you for being here today and goodbye.